Uh, Monday, February 13, 2006, regular meeting of the Cape Elizabeth Town Council. Could we have roll call by the town clerk, please? Chairman Badger. Present. Councilor Dale. Present. Councilor Fritz. Here. Councilor Lynch. Present. Councilor McKenney. Present. Councilor Moles. Here. Councilor Smith-Payana. Here. Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Could I have a motion to approve our the minutes of our regular meeting number 2-2006 from January 9, 2006. So moved. Second. Any comments on the minutes? Hearing none, all those in favor? The minutes are approved, seven in favor, zero opposed. And could I have a motion to approve the minutes of our special meeting, number 3-2006, held on Monday, January 23, 2006. So moved. Second. A motion and a second. Discussion on the minutes, or on the motion. All those in favor? Minutes are approved, seven in favor, zero opposed. It is um, that time in our meeting, and there are two occasions in each meeting, where there's an opportunity for citizens to discuss items that are not on our agenda for the evening. So if anyone would like to discuss anything that is not on the agenda, you are welcome to come forward to the podium. If you would state your name and address, please, and if you would spell your last name for us. Yes. My name is Fred Thompson. I am not a resident of Cape Elizabeth, although I was on the Cape Elizabeth Fire Department as a volunteer for six years. Up until recently, I was the uh, chairman of the board and president of the main broadcasting system, and I held that position for 17 years, and that included the television stations of WCSH TV Channel 6 and WLBZ TV and Channel 2 in Bangor. I come to you tonight because I'm very concerned about a property that used to belong to my grandparents that is on the Cape Shore in Cragmore. I will just pass out these pictures that were taken in 1926 by my grandfather when he built the home using architects that he had when he was building the Eastland Hotel, when he was, and their uh, the prospective plumbers, electricians, etc. Mo the modern conveniences of 1926 were included in this house, and I think if you, anybody is familiar with it, you will realize that it is quite a gem to the town of Cape Elizabeth. I'm going to pass out some pictures here, if I may. And I would just like to pass them around, and I'll pass them out to each one of the counselors. Um, that's the picture of the house as it was two weeks ago. And this is the picture of the house as it was taken today. You'll notice about a third of the house is gone. Um, I know we get on a very slippery slope when you start talking about restrictions and discussions of people's homes and their properties. But I think you also get on a very slippery slope when you start talking about taking away some of the best pieces and vestiges of a community. The, there are, I've, I know through at least three other discussions and including a discussion with the city manager that in all probability the main house will be taken down within six months. 
I don't think this is fair. I don't think this is something that the, the town wants to get involved with. Um, I know that this, it used to be that people who had a lot of money, I think the community looked up to leadership and to integrity and to um, presenting a real position in the community. Unfortunately, I think it comes about that now some people have too much darn money. And I think what's happening is you get, you get McMansions by Munchausen, you get people who want to tear down old houses or established houses to make a statement. I don't think that's fair. I don't think that's what this community wants. I think I'm, I'm pleading to you. I, I guarantee you, I am one, the last one who really should be preaching about restricting historic and bringing historic ordinances before you. But I think there are some exceptions. And I think this is one of them. And I don't think that it would take much to have a review board or some sort of uh, policy where you, the, the very best of your community can at least be studied and responded to. And uh, hopefully um, you feel the same way I do. I think there's a certain integrity um, with the people who, who cherish these types of buildings. And I think there's a lack of integrity with conspicuous consumption. That's all I have to say. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. Um, I appreciate your comments. And I will note and that I think before my tenure on the council, and perhaps the year before, I know that the council considered at great length a proposed historic preservation ordinance. And it was fairly controversial. Um, there were public hearings, there was a lot of input, um, and ultimately a decision was made not to uh, create an ordinance to protect various, well, I'm not quite sure what the net effect of it was, but the ordinance was not enacted. But thank you for your comments. Are there any other citizens that would like to speak about any matters that are not on our agenda this evening? Is Nancy Miles still here? <laughs> <laughs> Nancy, if you would join me. Now, Nancy, your job is to stand here and be embarrassed while I read that something. Won't be hard. <laughs> Tonight, we have the pleasure of honoring. Nancy Miles with a presentation of the Ralph Gould Award. Um, the Ralph Gould Award is presented for her impressive record of volunteerism in the town of Cape Elizabeth. And before I start on this, I want to acknowledge that your unofficial biographer, Carol Fritz, <laughs> put together the information that is the basis for what I am about to say. So, to the extent that anything that I'm about to say is correct, you can thank your unofficial biographer. To the extent that anything I'm about to say is incorrect, You're excused. I made it up. So, Nancy Miles, formally retired in 1999 after 25 years as a special education teacher in school districts in both New Hampshire and in Maine, um, including seven years in Cape Elizabeth, Pond Cove, and middle schools. And I use the term retired loosely because, as you will hear, retirement certainly doesn't seem to have slowed her down any. In fact, it seems to have kicked her into a much higher gear. Um, Nancy was a member of Cape Elizabeth's original recycling committee for six years and served as chair for two years. During that time, many projects that we take for granted today had their beginnings public education, signage, home composting, 
the book swap, recycling in the schools, and the collection of returnable bottles for school and athletic groups. Back in the 1970s, before many people probably even knew what recycling meant, um, she helped organize and coordinate a four-town recycling program in New Hampshire. More recently, just four months ago in October, Nancy completed nine years on the board of the Cape Elizabeth Land Trust, serving as board secretary for six years and as chair of the education committee for six years. She also served as a member of the Land Trust's governance committee. She helped lay the groundwork for a program for fourth grade teachers to provide Pond Cove students with guided walks in Robinson Woods to enable students to observe the plants and wildlife as part of the science curriculum in coordination with the main learning results. In the middle school, she coordinated the annual trail construction projects involving all 158th graders where the students completed trail improvement projects and constructed new sections of trail in Robinson Woods, Dyer Hutchinson Farm, Willowbrook, and Runaway Farm. In the high school, she helped coordinate the annual three-week program with high school seniors who, as part of their senior transition project, undertook major trail construction projects and learned about land conservation. Working with community services, she coordinated adult and family guided walks led by community experts to observe birds, trees, wildflowers, ferns, and the vernal pools in conserved land areas of town. Serving as a liaison from the Land Trust, Nancy has worked with the Conservation Commission, coordinating various projects, including the, formal, the former middle school essay contest, National Trails Day activities, and trail construction. As a master gardener volunteer, Nancy maintains the garden at the entrance to the pool and fitness center. She has also worked with Pond Cove students and teachers, teaching them about flowers and gardening and cultivating a pride in the beautification of their school grounds. Nancy was instrumental in creating the Cape Community Garden at Gullcrest Fields, along with other master gardeners, and with help from her husband, Frank. She continues to provide the primary leadership for running the garden, which is now in its fifth year. She coordinates supplies and maintenance and gives gardening assistance and educational tips about organic gardening to individuals and families who have individual garden plots. She also helps grow and harvest produce for donation to food pantries as part of the Plant a Row for the Hungry program. The garden has contributed almost 1,000 pounds of produce in the last four growing seasons to food pantries. Nancy, congratulations on behalf of all of the citizens of Cape Elizabeth for everything you have done to enrich their lives as part of your nonstop volunteer efforts. So, thank you so much. I'd just like to say that I feel very honored to receive this award and also humbled and would like, uh, I wish there were a place on this for lots of other volunteers because I, the projects that I've worked on were accomplished with the help of um, many other volunteers, many of them in this room, for which I'm uh, very grateful. And uh, I think the important part of volunteering is that you receive as much as you give. Um, and the friends that I've made and the sense that whatever we did improved, made some positive contribution to the, to the town, making it a better place for all of us was a very satisfactory part of my efforts and I hope to keep on doing the same thing. <laughs> And Nancy is the 2005 recipient of the Ralph Gould Award. And on the wall there, next, just to the left of those double doors, 
um, is a permanent plaque that is inscribed with the names of previous recipients of the Ralph Gould Award um, and to which uh, Nancy's name will be added. Um, reports and correspondence. Councillors, any reports or correspondence? Hearing none, uh, we will turn to the next item on the agenda, which is the town manager's report. And I guess in introducing this, I should note that our town manager, uh, Michael McGovern, is um, not here tonight. Um, and in his place, we have our assistant town manager, Deborah Lane. And the reason that uh, Michael McGovern is not here is because last year, Michael was elected um, to the Board of Directors of Rotary International, which is a very high honor. Um, he is one of only six um, members of the International Board from the United States, and he represents the whole northeastern section of the country, which actually includes more than just New England. And he travels um, a fair amount. Um, nationally and internationally as part of it. And the council has encouraged his participation um, in that. We think it's great continuing training for him. It represents the town of Cape Elizabeth and the state of Maine well throughout the world. And he is off, um, I think, in Chicago and San Diego this week um, in continuing training and in international meetings. So, um, town manager's report, Deborah Lane. There's uh, none this evening, only to report that Michael will be back with you next month and report that time. So. Okay. <laughs> which brings us to the first item on our agenda, and probably the item for which many of you are here this evening. Um, and this is item number 39-2006, um, a citizen petition to amend the zoning ordinance uh, for the prohibition of certain shortcut connectors on local streets. Um, by way of um, a bit of background, on January 20, um, a petition was filed with the town clerk, and as required by um, our town charter, the petition, um, after having been signed by at least 10% of the town's 7,695 voters, um, the petition has been set for public hearing. The town charter requires that within 30 days of the petition being filed that a public hearing be set. Um, and this evening's hearing is within 30 days of the January 20 filing. Um, under the town charter, the council is required within 30 days from tonight's public hearing to designate a date to submit the petition to a referendum vote of the town's citizens. Unless prior to the referendum vote, the council decides to enact the ordinance on, his own, on its own. So with that procedural background, we are prepared to hold the public hearing this evening. Um, and for everybody's benefit, I just would like to make clear what we are doing tonight as well as what we're not doing tonight. Um, we are holding a public hearing, which is an opportunity for the public to provide input, comment on the petition. Uh, the council um, is likely not to debate this at length uh, tonight. Um, and the council is likely to vote to defer consideration of the petition until our <coughs> March meeting, our March regular meeting. Um, deferring it until March will provide us with the opportunity to receive any input that we may need from the town attorney, uh, Tom Leahy. Um, who is here with us this evening. Um, he may or may not participate, but he's here to listen and provide us in the ensuing month with any legal advice that may be required as a result of issues that are raised tonight. Under the uh, council rules, um, 
Each person is entitled to speak for up to three minutes. The council, uh, by majority vote, has the discretion to extend the time limit uh, for any speaker. Um, recognizing that the proponents of the petition have been seemingly represented by a primary spokesperson to this date, um, I would like to uh, have the council um, entertain a motion, if someone's willing to make it, to permit the proponents of the petition, as well as any representative from anyone opposing the petition, to speak for um, up to 20 minutes on the petition, permitting all other citizens, other than the primary spokesperson, to speak for the council allotted rule time of three minutes. Um, I don't know whether there is any organized group in opposition, and although the petition, at least by writing does not designate a particular development as being within the target of the petition. It's not difficult to read the petition and to understand that Spurwink Woods uh, development was the original impetus for the creation of the petition. So if there is someone from Spurwink Woods or a representative of the Spurwink Woods group that would like to speak for up to 20 minutes and make a presentation, they're welcome to. There's certainly no obligation to do that. So is anyone willing to move to permit um, a representative of the petitioning group and someone um, that might want to represent the Spurwink Woods group to speak for up to 20 minutes as part of the presentation? I make a motion that we allow a 20 minute presentation by both the proponent and a representative of Spurwink Woods on this issue. Second. Discussion on the motion? All those in favor? Opposed? The motion is approved. Uh, seven in favor, zero opposed. So we'll permit that additional uh, time presentation. Now, I would like to, before we get started, um, just remind people that one of the joys, I guess, of being able to listen the last couple of years during my tenure on the council and during previous years on the zoning board and hearing citizens come forward is that whenever there is public debate in Cape Elizabeth, the tone of civility that permeates public discourse is always something that I think makes us proud to hear. Um, and I would expect that this evening will be no different than that. And in keeping with that tradition, I would simply ask that anyone speaking um, speak to the issue of the petition and not to personalities. Uh, comments that speakers make should be directed to the council and not to individual citizens and not to people who are in attendance. Um, and under the council rules, we request that people not applaud or otherwise express approval or disapproval of statements or actions taken during the meeting, um, and that everyone listen respectfully to whatever point of view is presented. I don't know how many people will be speaking, but to the extent that we do have a fair number of people that might want to speak, um, in order to keep the flow moving, um, once citizens do start to present, it might be helpful, rather than waiting for one person to stand up and speak and then go sit down, if a couple of people would sort of be in line, sort of in the wings waiting, so we can keep the hearing moving along. And we will go as long as we need to to give everybody an opportunity to speak. So with that said, um, Richard Bryant um, is here and has been the sort of point person for the petition to date, and I assume, Richard, that you would like to take the lead? Uh, I would with um, one caveat, that is, rather than listen to me speak the whole time, uh, the whole 20 minutes, I thought that I would try to keep my presentation to a little over 10 minutes and then turn it over to Lyndon Keck, another member of our group who's an architect who can speak much more articulately about some uh, neighborhood design issues.
And one other thing that I would ask, and we'll let uh, this start with Mr. Bryant. When you come to the podium, if you would please tell us your name and spell your last name and tell us your address. Uh, because the minutes will reflect at least by name and address um, everyone who spoke this evening. And for the benefit of our town clerk who is keeping the minutes, it would be very helpful for her to have that. Okay. Uh, before I get started, there's one other item that I'd like to pass out to the council. You can each take a copy of that. It's a copy of another illustration that I'll be using up here. Um, you can tell that it's professionally prepared, but not by a professional artist. Um, it was prepared by me. And my name is uh, Richard Bryant, also known as Nick Bryant. I live at 55 Spurwink Avenue here in Cape, and I was the principal drafter of the uh, petition that's in front of the council tonight. I'm also a member of a group that calls itself the Neighborhoods for Sensible Development. To start out with, I just want to make very clear from the outset um, that this petition is intended solely to prevent shortcut traffic through existing neighborhoods. It's not intended to ban development. It's not intended to ban, or excuse me, to jeopardize public safety. It does protect existing homeowners' property rights, but it does so while respecting developers' property rights. What I'd like to do in my presentation is explain the problem with Cape's current zoning and show why shortcut traffic needs to be addressed, discuss the mechanics of how the petition works, and then make clear what the petition will do and what it won't do. And then I'll turn matters over to Lyndon Keck here. The first item I'd like to point out is simply a map of Cape Roads. Uh, the current zoning ordinance uh, classifies roads into five separate categories, the first four of which I call major roads. And those are arterials, which is basically Route 77. And you've got uh, connectors, and you've got rural collectors, and you've got feeder streets. And the map that I sent to you last week uh, was just a shrunken map of this, and it's simply, they're all in black rather than distinguished. Every other road in Cape Elizabeth is a local street. These major roads are the backbone of the transportation system in Cape Elizabeth. They're designed to move traffic from one part of Cape to the other. All the other streets, the local streets, are designed to serve local neighborhoods. Residential development in Cape has typically relied upon access from major roads. Typically, residential development in Cape has been a subdivision, perhaps as a dead-end road. Um, Mitchell Woods, uh, Mitchell Highlands is an example of that. Or it can be a loop road that has two connections to a major road. Uh, Elizabeth Farms is that way. Stonegate is another example of that. Unfortunately, as usable major road frontage decreases, developers are going to be developing the areas between the major roads, and they will be looking to get access not off major roads, but off local streets. And that is what creates the problem. Cape zoning is based on a theory of connectivity, which encourages developers to connect developments to as many possible roads as possible. Um, and the primary tool of that is the dead-end road ordinance, which says that you cannot create a dead-end road that's longer than 2,000 feet in length or serves more than 20 houses. And connectivity theory has sort of three bases of support. The principal rationale is public safety. The notion is that having more than one way to get to a house uh, is likely to save lives and property in the case of an emergency like a road being blocked by a fallen tree or a power line. That rationale makes sense, and it's why we support connectivity. Connectivity boosters will also argue that connections made between developments foster a sense of community. But that's only true for some types of connections. If I live in one subdivision and there's a bike path or a local road that connects my subdivision to the next subdivision over, that may well foster a central social connection between those two roads and the people who live on them. But if you put a through road between me and my neighbor's house, that doesn't foster a sense of community that disrupts a community and disrupts a neighborhood. The third basis of connectivity is that connectivity theorists will argue that Connectivity can actually decrease traffic on major roads. 
And the concept here is that if you allow lots of different alternate routes for traffic to take, the traffic will disperse itself throughout the road network instead of concentrating on the major roads. And unfortunately, it's that portion of the theory which leads us to the dark side of connectivity, and that's cut through traffic. Because this theoretical benefit of dispersing traffic through the road network has a very real cost, and that's pushing that traffic into neighborhoods. If, again, if a connection simply connects adjacent subdivisions without a shortcut, the neighborhood grows a little, there will be more traffic, but the traffic is proportional to the growth of the neighborhood. If a connection allows for shortcut traffic that goes between major roads through a neighborhood, there's an inevitable price of that, and that's the disruption of the existing neighborhoods, less safe neighborhood streets because of all the through traffic rushing through it, and lower property values. There's a reason that people pay a premium for privacy and quiet and safety and Cape developments here, as opposed to living on Forest Avenue in Portland or on the grid of streets in downtown Portland. This notion of, of cut through traffic is not a unique problem to Cape. You can look in the papers and in the past several months there have been stories about Portland Planning Board and City Council wrestling with that problem. There's stories about Yarmouth and other suburban uh, towns wrestling with the same problem. It's true that this petition was sparked by Spurwick Woods, but the fact that we got 10% of the voters in Cape from all over Cape Elizabeth to sign the petition shows that it's a problem that has more <coughs> application throughout town than simply one development. Spurwink Woods ended up creating, or is proposed to create, a shortcut of more than a mile between Mitchell and Spurwink. And it did that by acquiring a house lot in the Mitchell Highland subdivision and putting a road through the yard, and on the other end, acquiring unbuildable lots from the town and pushing the shortcut through to Spurwink. Those same kind of transactions can take place around other isolated neighborhoods in Cape Elizabeth, and that's where the threat lies. What's the solution? The solution is not to ban development that's unconstitutional, violates people's property rights. The solution is not to ban connectivity and just repeal the dead-end road ordinance because that's bad for public safety. The solution is to narrowly target the one known downside of connectivity, and that's shortcut traffic exactly what this petition does. How does the petition work? It creates three new zoning definitions. A through road, which is simply a road with more than one connection to the network of roads. Very common sense, the opposite of a dead-end road. The shortcut, which is a through road that creates a shorter travel path than exists, between, than exists through the existing road network. Again, a common sense measurement. Developed residential street, which is a local street that has at least five homes on it, basically a neighborhood. And what the petition does, it simply says that you cannot create a proposed shortcut through road between major roads that uses existing residential local streets. And I do have this wonderful schematic diagram that attempts to illustrate the kind of development that, is, that can take place between major roads. This is what I just passed out to the council here. Basically, there are seven ways that someone can develop between major roads. They can extend an existing dead end to the limit of the dead end road ordinance. They can create a new dead end subdivision off a major road. They can create a loop road from an existing subdivision, which doesn't create a shortcut, therefore is not banned by the petition. They can create a new loop road. Again, no shortcut created, and it doesn't affect existing residences. They can create a, a shortcut through road between major roads, but that doesn't use any existing neighborhoods. Or they can create a very windy long road using an, coming off an existing neighborhood that doesn't create a shortcut because it's a longer traveled path than through the existing road network. The last thing they can do is they can simply connect existing subdivisions with a shortcut. What the petition does, it says that in this instance, that's not allowed. With one exception, the planning board can say, I'll allow that shortcut if you put a barrier there that only allows emergency traffic, namely emergency vehicles, public works vehicles, or even regular through traffic in the case of a public emergency. 
say this road was blocked by a power line down, <clears throat> the public authorities could open that gate and allow regular traffic to divert through there for as long as necessary. There are three other points about how the petition works. Just like the dead end road ordinance, a shortcut ban can't be waived by the planning board. Second, the planning board can approve these shortcuts through residential neighborhoods if they have these limited access barriers. That protects public safety. And the third point is that this petition does apply to developments which have not gotten their final approvals, just as permitted under Maine law. Now, Attorney Leahy, over the past week or so, has been corresponding with me because he has a duty under the ordinance, or excuse me, the town charter, to make sure that the petition language is legal and unambiguous. Um, he raised a question as to whether the original petition language might, in some circumstances, potentially create a ban on development that would be an unconstitutional taking. We disagree on whether that's likely, but the point is we should avoid any possibility of that kind of illegality. So uh, Attorney Leahy has proposed some revisions to the plan, or to the petition, to make sure it interacts appropriately with the dead end road ordinance, and those are entirely appropriate, and I support those changes. They carry out the intent of the petition. There are a couple other objections I just might anticipate quickly and give you what response they might have. Someone might ask, but doesn't this change the rules for pending developments? The answer is yes, it does. But Maine law is very, very clear that no project has a vested right to be grandfathered under an existing ordinance until they've got their final approval. And that makes sense. If there were a loophole in our ordinance and a developer figured out, looking at the ordinance, golly gee, I can put a fireworks factory in a residential neighborhood or put a piggery next to town hall. The town should have the right to amend the ordinance before that project is finally approved to prevent that kind of mistake. And that's what we're proposing here. Shortcut traffic can be a huge mistake, disrupt neighborhoods, and we want to fix it before it occurs. Second point about that is that grandfathering cuts both ways. The only other item on your agenda tonight is a change to the bisected lots ordinance. That change is proposed to create an exception that will allow Cape zoning to make the Spurwink Woods development legal because right now it doesn't comply with the ordinance. So changing ordinances should not be a one-way street for developers only. It should be used to make sure mistakes don't happen. Second question is, doesn't this undercut the planning board? No, it does not. The planning board still has the authority to review all subdivisions and site plans for compliance with the zoning ordinance. In fact, with the changes that Attorney Leahy has proposed, the petition actually clarifies the planning board's authority to allow shortcuts with limited access, which affirms the planning board's current view of the dead end road ordinance. Another question might be asked, doesn't this usurp the town council's power? Absolutely not. This petition, just like any other law, once it's enacted, can be amended or repealed by the council at any time in the future. If experience shows that the petition is bad public policy and everybody recognizes that neighbors should welcome with open arms that shortcut traffic coming through their neighborhoods, then you have the authority to change the ordinance. I don't think that's likely to happen, but that's a red herring issue. In any event, right now I'll turn the presentation over to Lyndon Keck, who can talk to you more about neighborhood design and shortcut traffic. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Bryant. And you have reserved five minutes of time for your guest speaker. I always hate following lawyers. <laughs> they never give you any time to talk. <laughs> the, uh, my name is Lyndon Keck. I split my time between two residences, 67 Field Road in Cumberland, and 42 Columbus Road here in Cape Elizabeth. And the spelling of your last name, K-E-C-K? K-E-C-K. Thank you. I have copies of uh, what I was going to speak about, and I'd like to pass those out to the members of the council so they can each have one. Uh, very briefly, uh, what I've done is I've prepared three drawings. Uh, the first shows street patterns. And it shows uh, information similar to what Nick just showed. It shows dead-end roads, loop roads, what I refer to as closed loop roads, shortcuts, and then the traditional suburban grid pattern. 
I've included in your packet a paper by the uh, University of uh, California Transportation Center that summarizes the advantages of the uh, dead-end neighborhoods, cul-de-sacs, and closed-loop roads. The drawing that I've prepared uh, shows the distinct differences and the basic disadvantages of shortcuts. Quiet dead-end neighborhood, quiet dead-end neighborhood where people come into the neighborhood and can leave by a different exit, but they come off the same collector. The shortcut, which is the worst of all, passable po worst of all possible patterns, simply because it can be a long distance between other shortcuts, so a lot of traffic gets funneled through one road. In fact, the grid pattern is actually a better lower traffic pattern layout for housing, residential neighborhoods, because there are lots of choices for the automobile. They're all shortcuts, but there are a lot of shortcuts. What we're objecting to is the notion that you take two dead-end neighborhoods and connect them and make one shortcut. Why are dead-end neighborhoods good? Why do realtors make such a big deal about advertising houses that are on quiet, dead-end streets? Why do families pay more for houses on loop roads and dead-end streets? First, traffic is slower primarily because of the traffic is homeowners traveling back and forth to their own homes. People know who you are and know your neighbors, your kids, and your pets. Second, dead-end streets provide what sociologists call defensible space. Defensible space grows out of strong social bonds, clearly defined boundaries, and a strong sense of personal ownership. People in dead-end neighborhoods know their neighbors. They recognize strangers, and they accept responsibility for keeping an eye on their neighborhood and protecting their turf. This is distinctly different from anonymous public space and undifferentiated grid patterns. Third, the quality of a dead-end neighborhood is that they are quieter because there is less traffic, less truck traffic, less through traffic. The fourth quality is there is much greater privacy because there are fewer reasons for strangers to drive into a dead-end neighborhood. The fifth quality is a stronger social network where less crowded streets don't become physical barriers between houses across the street. The sixth quality is a much greater safety for children's play for pedestrians and bicycles. On our dead-end street, Columbus, there are three basketball hoops at the edge of the pavement. Children ride tricycles and bicycles in the street, and there isn't a need for sidewalks. Cape Elizabeth is unique because of the extensive number of dead-end communities. Mr. Keck, I'm going to give you your two-minute warning. Thank you. Uh, I've got prepared a, uh, a drawing of your town, and it's the red represent dead-end neighborhoods, dead-end streets, and the green represent dead-end loops. If you go back to the pattern that I showed earlier, you can see that this is quite extensive. Uh, by my estimation, there's approximately 90 dead-end roads in Cape Elizabeth, and there are over 30 dead-end loops in Cape Elizabeth. This petition is about preserving the uniqueness of the small-town character of Cape Elizabeth and about protecting small, quiet residential neighborhoods. It is about protecting the investment that hundreds of families have made when they bought their homes in what they thought was a dead-end neighborhood. This petition is about empowering citizens and protecting their property rights while still allowing continued residential development to continue to occur in Cape Elizabeth. I encourage you to support and adopt this ordinance to continue the Cape Elizabeth legacy of protecting and developing quiet, private, low-speed, dead-end neighborhoods in Cape Elizabeth. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you to you and to Mr. Bryant for honoring the time allotment. Very well done. Anyone else who would like to speak, and this is not something that um, necessarily needs to be in the order of proponents, or opponents. So in any random order, anyone who would like to speak, by all means, feel free. I'm sorry?
The, uh, yes, but the uh, 20 minutes from anyone opposing doesn't have to take place at this point. But seeing Mr. McFarland <laughs> on his way to the podium. <clears throat> Good evening. My name is Jim McFarland. That's M-C-F-A-R-L-A-N-E. I live at 4 Belfield Road in Cape Elizabeth. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, members of the board, and members of the community, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to address you tonight. We are here today not because of a planning process that doesn't work and not because the town of Cape Elizabeth isn't doing a good job overseeing our growth and development. We are here because a small group of neighbors are trying very hard to derail a project that will bring 42 new units of housing, some at market rate, some affordable, to the town of Cape Elizabeth. The neighbors say they are worried about traffic and connecting streets. They say they want no shortcuts in Cape Elizabeth neighborhoods ever. They say this, but they are not taking public safety issues into consideration. Their only real objective is to derail the Sperwink Woods project. Where were they before we proposed our project? This is about keeping development out of their neighborhood and nothing more and should be seen as such. Both state and local planning principles have long recognized that it is much safer to connect neighborhoods rather than to have a series of dead-end streets. Ambulances, fire trucks, police, and EMTs that need to get to an emergency do so much faster if neighborhoods are connected. We are offended that these neighbors think they can take matters into their own hands, urging the town to sacrifice sound planning principles in support of their private agenda to stop Sperwink Woods project. The town has professionals who work for the residents managing our growth and planning for our future. The citizens pay these professionals and they keep our town operating in a very acceptable fashion. Most of our officials have weighed in on the whole connectivity dispute and their comments are worth noting. I would like to share with the public portions of a memo from town manager Mike McGovern to the Planning Board dated December 23, 2005. In his memo, Mr. McGovern says, and I quote, the need for connectivity and the desire not to have neighborhoods with a single access has been around for decades. It would be fortunate for the Planning Board to give attention to over 38 years that this has been an issue in Cape Elizabeth. Some try to personalize this issue as a pet issue of the current planner. Doing so ignores that the fact that over 15 individuals in the positions of fire chief, police chief, public works director, town manager, and town planner have consistently held the same position. In fact, every person in these positions has raised concerns with dead-end streets and with the inadequacy of emergency-only access points. The public safety aspect of this issue has changed little since the mid-1960s." Mr. McGovern's memo is supported with over 40 pages of documentation from town officials supporting his position that connectivity is in the best interest of the entire town of Cape Elizabeth. <clears throat> One example I'd also like to share with you is from a memo dated January 3rd, 2006 from Phil McGoldrick, our fire chief. He states, and I quote, I believe that for the safety of our citizens and in the best interest of public safety delivery, we should always have two ways out, just like we teach in exiting homes and businesses. In summary, I believe the planning board and department heads have, made, have to make unpopular decisions, but in the best interest of the town and the safety of our citizens. Anytime we can provide multiple accesses or exits from an area, we should professionally support it. End quote. Next, I would like to touch on traffic. In the subdivision application process, the town has required Spurwink Woods provide a traffic study, which was completed by Goral Palmer Consulting Engineers, Incorporated. The study has been peer-reviewed by Tom Errico of Wilbur Smith Associates for the town of Cape Elizabeth. In both reports, these professionals concluded that cut-through traffic would not be significant. I would also like to add that the roads have been designed with local standards of the subdivision ordinance, meaning that they include a 22-foot width esplanade with street trees and sidewalk on one side. 
the narrow width of the roads and the curvilinear alignment, raised crosswalk, and proposed stop signs are all expected to discourage the use of these roadways by cut through traffic. Thus, the proposed shortcut, which most likely would take longer, and we all know that people will only use a shortcut provided that it saves them time. And finally, according to the town's own attorney, Tom Leahy, the current petition, would, which would be retroactive if voted in, would change the laws of how we plan our town. First, the petition would result in a permanent moratorium on development of certain Cape Elizabeth land. Second, the petition would substitute the current planning board's duty and authority to review subdivisions for compliance with current standards. And third, the petition would usurp the town council's exercise of police powers in the interest of public safety to lay out roads. What municipality would want to give up these rights? I grew up in Cape Elizabeth and chose to come back here to raise my family. Cape Elizabeth has changed a lot over the years, but it still remains a wonderful place to live. I don't believe that change is bad, but change forced on a town by a neighborhood petition because they don't like what's going on there in their backyard is wrong. The not in my backyard syndrome is an American hallmark, and what's best for them isn't always what's best for the town. When did these people become town planners and civil engineers? I don't want to see the Cape Elizabeth residents go through a public vote, wasting time and taxpayer dollars in an ordinance change that isn't in the best interest of this town. Why would we, the citizens of Cape Elizabeth, want to support an ordinance change that our town manager, our town planner, our director of public works, our chief of police, and our fire chief don't support or believe is sound planning? It just doesn't make sense. In the interest of what is best for the town and in support of the positions of these town officials, I invite Mr. Bryan and the neighbors for sensible development to take their petition off the table, and I urge our public officials to stand firm in their efforts to support what's best for this town. Thank you. And I've got a copy of uh, that for each one of you so that you have a record. Thank you, Mr. McFarland. Thank you. Hmm. Hello, my name is Philip Nedwell, N-E-B-W-E-L-L. -L. I live at 5 South Street. I've been in the Cape Elizabeth for five years. I am not against this development. I'm a builder. I build in my backyard and I'm very proud of what I build. What McFarland and company are proposing to do is bring a road through my street, which now services one house. It's about 200 feet long. It's a private access way. They're proposing to connect South Street to this development, which will drive traffic down my street, which has no speed limit, which has no stop signs, it has a dangerous curve at one end before you even get to Spurlink. There's a telephone pole directly in the middle of the road. I've been to the police chief, I've been to the fire chief, I've been to the public works department, and code enforcement Bruce Smith. All of those people, unquote, would not comment on why they think this should not happen. But however, there is a problem with trying to connect neighborhoods to roads that are not to town standards, are not to town or, or public ways where you can drive more than two vehicles at the same time passing north and south or east and west. We are opposed to this because we want public safety. If McFarland wants to do this project, then you should upgrade South Street and Stephenson and make them a proper road with proper signs, proper speed limits. And if you want to incorporate sidewalks, great but at least make them passable for all conditions. And do not let people ruin our neighborhoods just because they want to make a fast buck. They talk about they live in Cape Elizabeth. None of these people live close to this neighborhood that will impact them in any way other than financially. So I urge you to please consider 
when you connect neighborhoods that they are done properly and thoroughly all the way through without saying, well, we ran short, we go a little further, we're not going to make enough money. They want the project, let it be deemed complete. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Nedwell. Uh, my name is Jean Scott, SCOTT. I live at 1 Stevenson Street in Cape Elizabeth. I've lived there for 42 years. Um, first of all, we are not opposed to Mr. McFarlane building his project. But he talks about a study done on the roads. Have they done the study yet on Spurwink Road? It's a 90 degree turn there. I haven't heard anything about it. Maybe it's coming up, I don't know. He talks about building for the town of Cape Elizabeth affordable housing. Yeah. I don't know what he's going to charge for these little bungalows, but I'm sure it's quite a bit. I oppose him building there only because of the connection to the road. The road is dangerous. The turn is horrid. If you've ever been down there, the cars that go around that corner go so fast that they have several times landed into my neighbor's yard, knocked all the trees down. They've knocked the mailboxes down many times because the road is treacherous. And they want to put all these cars in. People are going to cut across Route 77, down Spurwink, through the development to get over into this other development. This is not good for the town. It's only good for the builders. They're only looking for the money. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Scott. Hi, my name is Peggy Hunter, H-U-N-T-E-R, and I live at 67 Columbus Road. And I don't necessarily have a, an opinion on Spurwink Woods, but I do have an opinion on shortcut roads. And I really support you trusting the citizens of this town who are intelligent, who can learn about this issue and decide on it. I think this should go to referendum, and I think we're all in this town capable of voting whether we want this ordinance or not. I urge you to bring it before the town, let it pass or not pass, let us show the, give the residents of this town an opportunity to vote for or against it. I support this petition, I signed it, and I hope that this ordinance passes. I feel that it will not only protect my quality of life and the safety of my children, it will give other members of this town that same feeling of security and um, protection of their quality of life as well. It's not just about my road, it's about our town. And I think that we can trust everyone in our town to vote appropriately. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hunter. My name is Miranda Newman, N-E-W-M. I'm, I'm sorry, can you tell us your name again? Miranda Newman. Newman? N-E-W-M-A-N. I live on 13 Hamlin Street. When my family and I moved there after a long two-year search for a nice, quiet, dead-end street to live on, we found this place. Then after a while, we found out that they wanted to add on to our nice, quiet neighborhood. And if they did, I would always be worried that my little sister could get hurt and my dog. I don't want this to happen, so please stop shortcuts through neighborhoods. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Newman. <coughs> My name is uh, Joseph Jones of 46 Columbus Road, J-O-N-E-S. <coughs> Although public speaking is not my forte, I nevertheless appreciate the opportunity to cast in my two cents, two cents in three minutes. I want to thank my fellow members of the uh, Neighborhoods for Sensible Development for their good example in community solidarity. I've been a blue collar worker all my life. I'm a back and shoulders man. I apologize ahead of time for any deficiencies I might demonstrate tonight in the area from the neck up. Having said this, I received a form letter last week from the developers sent to the petitioners. I found it contrived, disingenuous, and patronizing. It proclaims that a small group 
of neighbors is working hard to stop their project. This is an unabashed falsehood. First, according to the 2005 Delorme map, Cape Elizabeth has 9,068 residents. That may not be a current number. When the number of minor children is factored in, uh, in this number, the number of eligible petitioners is much, much less. And yet some 800 signators supported our petition. Just the post postage on these letters had to cost hundreds and hundreds of dollars. Second, <clears throat> no one has subscribed to the notion of derailing anyone's investment project, but only to curtail irresponsible and imposing planning. That is, the attachment of our neighborhoods to their deep pocket pro uh, project. And so the victimizers are posing as victims, carrying aloft the benign banner of connectivity. And so black is white and white is black, and I suppose the earth is as flat as my last old lady. Further, the developer's letter suggests staunch support from the lofty quarters of the town manager, the fire chief, the chief of police, and the director of public works. I doubt this, but even if it's true, I am not intimidated. I vote. I have never once voted for leadership, but only for fair and honest representation. The concept of the common good of the people can never be delegated, but can only be self-determined by the citizenry. Therefore, it is my opinion that any elected or appointed officials who would take up the cause of a special interest group above the fair consideration of the consensus should have their tenure in office come under review at the proper time. It is my contention that <clears throat> the uh, entrepreneurial investments should never preempt or compromise the greatest investment most of us will make, that of home and hearth. I therefore and adamantly, immutably opposed to the Spurwink Woods project bulldozing its way through my neighborhood. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. General. Good evening. My name is Holly Hoffman and I live at 42 Columbus Road. Thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight. I moved to Maine nine years ago from Baltimore, where I had watched the city deteriorate into the Northeast Crack Corridor and seen a drug and crime epidemic destroy the quality of life for many people. When I left in 1997, the murder rate was over 460 homicides a year. I share this to underscore how grateful I am to live in a safe and beautiful town. I was incredibly happy to move to Maine, to come home to the place where my grandmother was raised, a place where it is safe to raise my family. I moved to Cape Elizabeth in 1999 and bought a home in a quiet, wooded, dead-end neighborhood, Columbus Road. When I purchased my home, there were two houses for sale on Oakhurst. The quality of those houses was far better than my ranch, and they were less expensive. But Oakhurst is a cut-through street, and at peak hours, there is considerable traffic. I chose to spend more money for a safer location on a dead-end street. Cape Elizabeth is full of small neighborhoods like mine, dead-ends and cul-de-sacs where families are safe and property values have climbed. The town faces a considerable challenge to grow and prosper, but in ways that respect the investment of current property owners and preserve its pastoral beauty, the very reasons people move here. What I have witnessed recently is an ugly and stealthy pattern of development spreading into Cape Elizabeth, and many neighborhoods are at risk. New development patterns that create shortcuts to major roads increase traffic volume and that increase has three negative results. First, high volumes of traffic jeopardize the safety of families. Second, cut-throughs damage property values. Third, cut-throughs eliminate defensible space, leaving neighborhoods vulnerable to crime. 
I believe neighborhoods become destabilized and less safe when developed in ways that allow cut through traffic. We are all invested in each other's property, whether we like it or not. That's true for our smaller neighborhoods, and it's true for the whole town. I urge my town council to adopt the revisions in the No Shortcuts petition so that our town can grow responsibly and in ways that we can all be proud of. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hoffman. Good evening, council members. My name is Sharon O'Neill. That's spelled O-N-E-I-L-L. -L. I live at 56 Columbus Road. My husband, Tim, and I have been <laughs> residents of Cape Elizabeth for almost seven years. In our search for a home, we sought out the dead-end features we enjoyed in our previous home in Cumberland. And since Tim had grown up in Cape Elizabeth, it seemed the most likely choice for us to raise our family. We support the petition for the following reasons. It protects quality of life. I recently spoke with a realtor to find out the difference in property values for a home of equal features in a dead end as opposed to a through street. The conversation, though, quickly turned to one of property values to quality of life. Our situation is equivalent to going to sleep on Columbus Road and waking up the next morning on Mitchell Road. We are facing at least 500 cars per day passing by our home that we never had before. As any of my neighbors can attest to, we chose Columbus Road for a reason. We found value in living in a dead-end neighborhood and the quality of life associated with it. And neither of us nor anyone else who may find themselves in a similar situation should be asked to accept anything less. It gives the planning board more options, not less. When the situation arises again as to connecting historically dead-end neighborhoods to major streets, the board will not have to struggle with the issue. They will be able to refer to the zoning ordinance in the same way they do for the dead-end road ordinance. <coughs> Currently, the planning board's hands are tied on the issue because no language is in place to define and prevent shortcut traffic. The amendment is specific in defining developed residential streets through roads and cut shortcuts. It does nothing more than protect established neighborhoods from shortcut traffic. It does not stop development. It simply means developers of the land will have to find another way if they are going to connect into established neighborhoods. For us, a dead end road equates safety. There's been a lot of talk of the need for connectivity as though we are being saved from our dead end neighborhood. Mitchell Highlands is an established subdivision which has been around for over 40 years. It is insulting to us, as we are sure it is to those who have lived there for most of those 40 years, to be told that building a shortcut road through our neighborhood is the best thing for us. We believe the opposite is true. We find safety in knowing that the people who drive in our neighborhood either live there or are visiting someone who lives there. And if something seems suspicious, one of our neighbors may just call the police to find out what they are doing there. Opening our neighborhood up to non-local through traffic leaves us vulnerable. Simply put, we don't need anyone to build a road through our neighborhood to make us feel safe. Finally, we initially became involved with the petition because we felt as though our rights as property owners were being trampled on and we had no power to do anything about it. It then became clear that this was a town-wide issue. There are many dead-end neighborhoods which abut up to potentially buildable land. All it would take is the purchase of a home in that neighborhood to build a road, and no dead-end neighborhood would be safe from shortcut traffic. We understand the concept of connectivity and how it can benefit the community, but sacrificing thriving neighborhoods for the sake of a the theory is short-sighted. We are not afraid of change. Change is inevitable and healthy. Let's make some changes. We would like to thank the Council for their time and thoughtful consideration. Thank you, Ms. O'Neill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for this uh, opportunity. My name is Hank Andolsek. I live at 70 Columbus Road, and I'm in favor of this petition. It's Andolsek, A-N-D-O-L-S-E-K. The issue of creating shortcut through streets potentially affects numerous neighborhoods in Cape Elizabeth. Residents are deeply concerned about this issue, which is clear by the diversity of the neighborhoods represented in the petition. The petition signers did not sign with the intent and objective of stopping development. They signed the petition 
because they wanted to protect their neighborhoods and prevent their neighborhoods from changing for the worse. I am not anti-development. I believe that a landowner should be able to develop or use their property in whatever manner they please, as long as they do so in compliance with the rules and laws of the state and town. However, I also feel that a landowner does not have the right to uh, detrimentally affect surrounding properties or neighborhoods through their land usage and or development. Dead-end streets are desirable places to live. They are quiet, they are safe, they invoke a sense of ownership throughout the neighborhood, they provide a feeling of defensible space. In other words, you, you feel secure knowing who's driving by and knowing that your neighbors are also watching out for you and more importantly, watching out for your children, especially when they're playing in the quiet streets. I suspect that the vast majority of residents who live on dead-end streets do so by choice. The opposing, those opposing this petition argue that connectivity is, the best, is in the best interest of the public safety. I am not opposed to connectivity. If done right, it is a good thing. But achieving connectivity at the cost of ruining a quiet, safe, desirable neighborhood is not right, is not a right thing or a good thing. This petition does not prevent good connectivity. It only prevents bad connectivity. Creating a shortcut through street off an existing dead-end neighborhood is bad connectivity. I'd like to address all those watching Cape Elizabeth television tonight uh, who are yet undecided on this issue, and for, those, for that matter, anybody in this audience who might be on the fence. In all likelihood, this issue will need to be resolved at the voting booth, and so I want to ask these questions for you to consider. Those opposing this pet petition cite public safety and connectivity issues as the main arguments for defeating this petition. These are my questions for those who currently live on dead-end streets. Do you feel unsafe living where you do? Do you fear for the safety of your children? And lastly, do you think your neighborhood would be safer, would be a safer, more desirable place to live if a shortcut through street was constructed? Well, the town does, and it's up to you to tell them otherwise. No dead-end neighborhood is safe from what this petition is trying to prevent. There are numerous dead-end streets in Cape Elizabeth, and under the current subdivision laws, there is nothing that prevents a developer from buying a house on your quiet street and turning it into a shortcut through road that connects a previously landlocked adjacent property. Lastly, I ask for your support in seeing that this petition be made into law. Please write letters to the town council expressing support for this petition, and if that doesn't work, be sure to come out and vote. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Indulce. Good evening. My name is Becky Fernald, and I live at F-E-R-N-A-L-D. <clears throat> I live at 313 Mitchell Road, um, and my, I live right next to Columbus Road as well. And when uh, my husband and I first moved to Cape Elizabeth um, 16 years ago, we specifically sought a quiet, dead-end neighborhood in which to raise our young children and when we first moved in Cape Verde, a different residence on a small dead-end street, which was wonderful and it was a great place to raise young children. And that was primarily the reason we moved to that house, so that we would have the safety of a dead-end street so our children could learn to ride bikes and you know, learn how to walk running down the road, and we didn't have to worry about the safety um, and traffic issues. And when we... Um, needed to move to a bigger house as our family was growing. We found a house we loved on Mitchell Road, which was an extremely busy road. Um, and we really had reservations about actually moving to that house, except that we were located right next to Columbus Road, which we thought was a wonderful area. It was um, small, dead-end streets all connected, and um, actually has proven to be a wonderful place for my uh, youngest child to learn how to ride bikes and she and they roller skate with friends in the neighborhood and ride scooters and I will not let my children when they were when they were young ride on Mitchell Road because I just think it's very dangerous but I'd let them go through the woods and just I'd be I feel very safe letting them go on Columbus and Thrasher and Kildare because those were dead-end streets and um, with the news that this um, a new cut through road was going to be built that was connecting essentially co connecting Mitchell to Spurwink and creating a shortcut uh, was very alarming to me 
because I saw the whole nature of this neighborhood and this safe cul-de-sac being um, jeopardized and being completely transformed into something else. I, you know, I feel badly also for the families who live right on that road, but um, it has been a nice safe haven for my children as well. Um, and that's why I support this petition of, of no shortcuts. I think that when people make their one of the biggest investments in their lifetime, buying a house and buy it for the specific reasons of a safety of a neighborhood for their children, um, that shouldn't be disrupted. And I don't want um, anyone for a minute to think that by supporting this petition, I'm against development in Cape Elizabeth. In fact, I think the Spermic Woods can continue to their development without doing a shortcut road. Um, and I, I know many of the people that I've talked to are not opposed to um, this development per se. Uh, but we want to preserve the, the safety of the neighborhoods, the quality of life in, in those neighborhoods. And I, as I became more involved um, with uh, this petition and, and supporting this petition, and I actually um, circulated the petition myself to get signatures, it was a very interesting experience because I talked to people from all over town, from um, the Two Lights area to um, Broad Cove, Shore Acres, to uh, Cranbrook, Stonegate, and, um, and the Oakhurst area. We, we had so much support for this concept of don't disrupt my quiet neighborhood. And there are ways to connect um, streets, way to connect neighborhoods that's much safer than these shortcuts. Um, and it really, I realize it is, it's a public policy issue that really needs to be addressed by the town and um, especially when we're looking now at revamping our comprehensive plan, I think it's a, it's a perfect time to address this issue and look at um, uh, um, <clears throat> promoting development that is safe and sensible in Cape Elizabeth. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, members of the council, my name is Paul Bolger. I'm a Cape Elizabeth resident. I live with my family at 8 Leiden Lane. Bulger is spelled B-U-L-G-E-R. Leiden Lane is off Mitchell Road near the affected area, um, the area affected by the Spurwink Woods project that has triggered uh, the debate in, in this initiative. Um, I think a lot of people in the room probably won't be real happy about what I have to say, but I'll go ahead and say it anyway. I don't have any stake in the project. I've known Jim McFarland, the developer, for 24 years, and I've known Nick Bryant for about 20 years, and I have a lot of friends right there in the immediate area around Columbus. Um, this is obviously a very, very difficult issue. I've worked as a, a business and real estate lawyer in uh, southern Maine for about 20 years. I've recently addressed the issue of street connectivity before the Portland Planning Board in the North Deering area where this was a hot topic. I can tell you from a seven to nothing vote by the planning board in Portland, by the, what the planner had to, planning office had to say in Portland, that planners believe emphatically in connectivity. This is not something, this is not a controversial issue. Um, they believe in this uh, without conditions for reasons that I can state. Um, I think all the other speakers have already spoken very articulately about uh, what connectivity is and how it will affect their neighborhoods and their what will be dead-end streets or their quiet areas in which they live. I think um, when I was asked to sign the petition, I was very clear with people that I would not, that I believe in this as a planning principle. Uh, and I, I can point to areas in Cape Elizabeth that really have a need for east-west traffic flow, rational, logical traffic flow for traffic and safety reasons, if nothing else. That uh, if I were to point to Broad Cove, today I would call that a man-made planning disaster in that there's no back end way to get out of the development. And that's not a criticism of Broad Cove, it's a wonderful drive down, but there's oftentimes a great deal of, of, of speed connected with drivers going through it because it's such a long drive, number one, 
But if you're in the middle of that project and you think about what happens, the person in the middle of the project sees all the traffic going by their home twice a day, whereas if it dispersed, if there was a back way out of the project, you could very well find, find yourself with 50% of the traffic reduced. So the child on his bicycle in the middle of the project is seeing twice the traffic they otherwise would. I think uh, maybe that's simplistic, but I think that's sort of putting a face on the issue. Just as importantly, the impact that an individual project will have on some of my neighbors should not form the basis of a town-wide policy. Um, I think this has already been said. The policy should be based on, based on a rational principle that the town can safely apply for the good of the entire community. Um, I can see the hardship. Lawyers say hard cases make bad law. You don't make your, your, your rules one case at a time. Sure, for Columbus Road residents, this may well be an imposition. What the town needs, however, is a system for traffic flow that's rational. Um, and, and I think I can tie this in with my last point. Uh, as a practical matter, what would be the result of these co the connection of these roads? From the site plan, it appears that the roads in and out of the Spurwinks Woods project are not a convenient cut through for existing neighborhoods. When I think about where I go off Mitchell Road, and I travel Mitchell Road everywhere, uh, north and south, I am not going to go down Columbus Road and through the Spurwink Woods project that for, for any reason. That would be utterly irrational. It would be longer. It would cause me to go one direction, another direction to get in a straight line out to 77, which won't exist. What that, those connected roads will permit is for the, the families that live in that project to make an election as to what is the shortest distance to get to where they want to go, be it school, be it church, be it uh, Mill Creek for shopping, get, be it over the bridge. Um, and I've thought long and hard about this. If I were to apply it to taking Wells Road and thinking should I make a cut through, through Cross Hill to get to the other side to a major arterial, uh, I wouldn't take that route either. I would take Wells Road to the arterial. Um, I think it's analogous. In any case, um, I, I, I think I'd, I'd make this point, and that is if I were living in the Spurwink Woods neighborhood and it doesn't connect with Mitchell Road, what I would have to do is go out of the development to 77, take a left on 77, then take a left onto Mitchell, then take and then travel down Mitchell to Oakhurst. If I were going into Oakhurst to drop my child off for a sleepover or to go to grandpa and grandma's house, well, what have I done? I've created several turns off several major arterials to get to a point that should be much more direct. If I live in the neighborhood, I'm not saying again that I would travel any of those major art or from from Mitchell Road out to 77 through Spurwink Woods development. That would again, be irrational. What I'm saying is if I live there, what, what I have to do to get any place else in town, if that doesn't connect, puts me in a very bad place. Puts me in, so I have to dr drive further and further distances over making a series of turns off the road. So from the standpoint of traffic safety, it, doesn't, it wouldn't make a lot of sense. And I think that what this does, connectivity permits you to rationalize this. I'm not talking fire trucks and, and, and uh, police vehicles, those are, those are just another element. So, um, in any event, I hope that uh, the council will consider carefully uh, the position that the town manager has taken on this issue. And I'd like us to keep our community vibrant, safe, and livable, and I'd start by defeating this proposition. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Belger. Good evening. <clears throat> My name is Leon Layton, L-A-Y-T-O-N. I live at 32 Columbus Road. And I did have a prepared statement, but after listening to everyone this evening, I'm curious as to what the background on the, the dead-end streets are no longer safe for people to live on. <clears throat> I have lived in New York and in California, and about half my <coughs> life was spent living on dead-end streets. I have never once come into a situation 
where that street was blocked for any vehicle, person, place, animal, or whatever by any means at all. I don't understand, excuse me, I don't understand what the rationale behind all of a sudden we need to open up all these streets. People have a choice in this country. <coughs> And the choice to whether or not to live on a dead end street or a connector street or whatever street you want is your choice. Many people have chosen dead end streets, as you've heard, as you've heard tonight, because they want the safety of it. They want the, the, the safety of knowing that their children can play, can walk down to their friend's house and be safe. So I just would like to reiterate my letter that I sent to you all earlier that, you know, please consider the people who live on the dead-end streets that are going to be affected by proposing cut-throughs through an existing lot on a in a house that will no longer be there. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Layton. Hi, my name is Frank Butterworth. That's B-U-T-T-E-R-W-O-R-T-H. I live at 21 Macaulay Road. I've been there for 21 years. That's in a neighborhood adjacent to where <clears throat> the cut-through street would go through. I do support the petition. Um, I don't support cut through streets. I'm not opposed to development because that's how I ended up in the neighborhood that I'm in. And I don't oppose connectivity. But uh, I think connectivity <clears throat> has a place where it makes sense. And I also think that if it's best for the people of Cape Elizabeth, then <clears throat> by going out to referendum, the people will support that. And uh, if the cut through does go through, I'll probably use it frequently. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Butterworth. My name's Lisa Cio, C-I-O-E, and I live on Stevenson Street in Cape Elizabeth. And I've lived there for nearly 40 years. Um, I grew up there. It used to be a dirt road. And I remember as a child sliding down that road on my sled with the runners. Um, I raised my daughter there. She's 13. She doesn't play in the street anymore. She'll ride her bike. But there are other children in that neighborhood who will suffer if this goes through and if there are cut through streets. That corner is so dangerous. Uh, the child across the street from my house has special needs. I want to see those kids play in that neighborhood like I did when I was a child. So I'm hoping that this goes to referendum. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Leo. Hello, counselors. My name is Ted Foden, and I live on <clears throat> 23 Ivy Road, and it's F-O-D-E-N. Uh, it's my first time at this uh, uh, venue, and I'm quite impressed, I'll have to say. Uh, however, I wasn't even going to speak. I didn't have anything uh, in front of me, but I thought I should speak because uh, I used to live on Ivy, I'm sorry, I used to live on Columbus Road for five years and um, we uh, had young children and we were very eager to move from that neighborhood because of the cars that scream down that street. They really do drive very, very fast and uh, I remember my father coming over and I'm saying, look at these, look how fast they drive down the street. And my father goes, boy, you've changed. But anyways, it was a... <clears throat> Very, very, it, it is a straight road, as straight as an arrow, and it's long, and people screamed on that road. We were very eager to move from that, you know, we looked into moving from that neighborhood to get to a, uh, a, we chose to move to Ivy Road, which is in the Oakhurst area. It's actually a cut-through road. It goes from Oakhurst to Shore Road, but it is by far more quiet, and it is more peaceful. We feel much more comfortable there. So I'm not sure that some of the aforementioned stories about how peaceful and quiet the dead end street of Columbus Road is, I would just would like to uh, caution that we found it. We were scared, very, very scared for our children to get down near uh, Columbus Road without being uh, close supervision. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Foden. My name is Priscilla Armstrong. I live at 18 Avon Road, and that's A-R-M-S-T-R-O-N-G. And I'm here to urge the petition to go forward to the voters. Um, I have been in this room um, on occasion when changes were suggested for my neighborhood, including a cell tower, which would have been in my backyard. And I understand that you see people coming forth when 
something is happening in a neighborhood and you get a particular perspective from a particular group of people that it will immediately impact. But I think that it is important for this petition to go forward because this is something that has potential for affecting the whole town. We hear all the time that people move to Cape Elizabeth for the quality of life here. They obviously don't move for the high taxes, but they're uh, willing to take on that kind of perhaps burden. But they expect when they come to this town that what they buy and what they invest in, that they understand it. I have a great deal of faith. I am always truly impressed when I come to vote and I see the turnout in Cape Elizabeth. And I truly believe in the intelligence of the electorate in Cape Elizabeth. I think that this is definitely a townwide issue, and I urge you to send this to the voters. Thank you, Ms. Armstrong. Is there anyone else who would like to speak? Good evening. My name is Tom Egan, E-G-A-N, and I live with my family at 41 Hannaford Cove Road, a property that I've owned there since 1980. It's a dead-end road, and it is a dead-end road in the in the most pure sense of, it, of the term because at the end of our road there is an ocean uh, and not a, an area that could be developed that we might have anticipated uh, uh, before we bought our property. Um, but to the side of Hannaford Cove there is a large undeveloped piece of property which is sandwiched between our very quiet, very nice long-lived neighborhood, safe neighborhood, and Broad Cove. Uh, but I think it was, what, four or five years ago, the town um, engaged in a process of analyzing whether Jordan Farm Road, I think it was, should be used as a, an exit, a second means of ingress and egress for Broad Cove. And that was a very contentious issue. And the same issues about safety and connectivity versus neighborhood was brought up in that exercise, and the town council resolved it in favor of using uh, Jordan Farm Road as an emergency road only. And I thought that was a very good decision. <coughs> I don't have a dog in the fight down on Columbus Road, um, but I do know Skip Murray and Jim McFarland and they are good people. And I've, I haven't felt very good about some of the things that have been said about the developers. It's secondary to the, uh, to the issue before you, but it's nevertheless important to say that these are men of integrity, and I don't think they're looking, well, I'm not going to assess their motives, but they are good people, they've worked hard in our community, they're uh, respected, and I hope that throughout the remainder of the debate over this process that it's a that people take note of that fact and not question or impugn their integrity or that of their families and in that regard when I received this letter as a signatory of the petition I said to myself this is the first time this has ever happened in 25 years I've never gotten something like this and I appreciated it very sincerely because it I didn't know that this was happening tonight. I wouldn't have been here but for this letter coming to me. And so I appreciate the developers bringing this to my attention and to those the, uh, the attention of the other petitioners. Um, a point was made earlier about the uh, comprehensive plan process. And I would encourage anybody in the town who believes in protecting quiet neighborhoods, dead-end dead end street neighborhoods, cul-de-sacs, to engage in the comprehensive plan process. And in that regard, the 1981 comprehensive plan, which I think is, was that the last one? No? no 1993. Oh. <laughs> well, that's the one that's in my file. <laughs> but, <laughs> um, I, you know, I was looking at it. It, it may, be, may be out of date, and maybe, maybe this point is addressed, but I noticed that the comprehensive plan has areas of protection and interest 
for the community to protect the quality of life here, to promote the health and welfare of the citizens. And those areas included tidal and non-tidal wetlands, surface water bodies, sand dunes, scenic, water uh, uh, scenic watersheds and vistas, active farmland, the green belt, aquifers and floodplains, historical and archaeological sites, talked about promoting diverse and affordable housing stock, and most important, it talked about protecting open space. Nowhere in the comprehensive plan was there a comment about protecting the quality and integrity of neighborhoods. So I invite people to engage in that process. Last, I have a question for the town lawyer. Um, there was mention earlier about an amendment to the petition. And I have a question about that. I'd like to know what the amendment is. And I think it would be appropriate for that to be laid before us tonight. So I asked the town council to do that. And uh, as a footnote, I don't like the retroactive aspect of this petition. Um, I understand that you have the power, or the town has the power, to make a, uh, an ordinance retroactive prior to the effective date. It's a hard thing. Changing the game rules after all of the players have been invited to engage in negotiations, um, fair dealing between the developer and the town. And that's, that's one aspect about this ordinance that I don't like, but can we, could you, remove the retroactive uh, paragraph or the retroactivity of this petition, just like you're going to amend some other aspect of it? I think that'd be an appropriate issue to discuss. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Egan. Is there anyone else who would like to speak? Seeing no one, I will declare this public hearing closed. And I would like to thank everyone who spoke for continuing what really has been a tradition to make us all proud. It's a tradition not only that sort of has been inherent in small New England life, but certainly in Cape Elizabeth, as I said at the outset, the comments and the arguments that everyone made were cogent, they were civil, um, they were eloquent, and they were all much appreciated. So thank you to everyone who spoke. Thank you to everyone who has sent us um, emails, um, the time for comment, at least the time for people to provide the council with continuing input um, is not over. Um, email is always a great way uh, to reach the council through the town website. Um, at this stage, um, I think I'd like to open it for council discussion before we even have a motion. Um, if there is any discussion that any would, anyone would like to present initially, then I, would, I will, will invite a motion. Councilor swift -Kayata. Um I'd like to hear from the town attorney because there have been some so there's been some information going back and forth, and I'd like to make sure that I at least am up to date, and I think uh, several people in the audience have expressed an interest in some of the fine points, and so I'd like to okay. hear. Tom, from could you him. favor us with um, particularly an explanation from um, Tom Egan's questions um, about what changes have been made uh, to the petition since it was originally circulated for signature uh, maybe why those changes have been made, and the limited role maybe of both you as town attorney and the role of the council to be able to make any changes um, 
Mr. Egan had asked if it was possible for the council to remove the retroactive portion of the petition, and maybe you could address that um, in connection with addressing what your limited function is in making changes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the council. Uh, let me take this second question first, because that's a short answer. I don't think it's within your power to change the petition in that respect. Uh, that provision that calls for retroactivity, in my opinion, is not illegal or unconstitutional as drafted. Um, there, our highest court has spoken to the issue in the Fishman's Wharf case, and whether it's a legislature or it's a town uh, municipal body, uh, whether it's through petition or otherwise, uh, reserves a right to apply it retroactively uh, to pending petitions. Now, there could be extreme cases where some applicant had been improperly delayed for two years and then comes to change, and that particular person on those facts may have a complaint. But as a proposition, I don't think it's within my power under the charter, and I have some to make some changes to the petition, but I can't change that because I don't believe it's unconstitutional in our highest court has spoken on the issue. So I think that's the easier issue of the uh, two to address. The other issue is what, what changes have been made to, to the petition through my office um, and me personally. Uh, what happened, there were two groups of changes. The first changes were very modest um, changes from using motor vehicle in uh, one sentence to vehicular in another just for consistency. And under the town charter, it is my uh, duty when I'm asked by the town council in this respect to um, change the form of the petition to avoid repetitions, illegalities, and unconstitutional provisions, and to assure accuracy in the text and references and clearness and precision in the phraseology. But the attorney shall not material change its meaning and effect. Um, so going back to the first issue, these petitioners want the meaning of retroactivity. I cannot change that because it's not illegal. So we had some housekeeping, and then the second issue is after a series of letters um, last week, um, I pointed out that, in my opinion, without looking at a particular project, that the interplay between the dead end street provisions and the new proposed petition changes created a situation where land could not be developed. And, and it's probably hard in this form to go give you a very uh, extensive description, but let's just say you have, a, you have two through roads, two major roads, you have a dead end street with 20 houses on it. The dead end street provisions state that the town planning board cannot approve a subdivision that would be off that dead end street with 20 or more units, including counting those on the street. So if one owned a parcel of, par a parcel of land, butting the end of a dead end street, 20 or more houses, if, if a developer wanted to do that, you would be right up against a non-waivable zoning ordinance provision that, that would be an inappropriate dead end street. So if there are shortcuts that would also go through in this, through this um, partially, well, they defined it as a developed uh, residential street, five or more dwelling units on it. And there's land after that dead end that is proposed to go out through another access point. So it's a through road. Uh, I said that if you, under the current ordinances in regard to dead end streets, and with their proposed definition that a through road shall not include one in which the planning board imposes a barrier, an emergency barrier. I said it's either a through road or a dead end street. If you impose a barrier and it's a dead end street, then you have to deal with the implication of the limits on density and limits on length. Richard Bryant, the proponent, asked me if we could adjust the language so not to run afoul of that, um, that issue. In other words, so we don't cause a taking, an unconstitutional taking, unless compensated, because he said that wasn't the intent or purpose of the petition. 
to prevent land from being developed, but rather to provide a tool such as barriers, emergency barriers that could be utilized and not run into this dead end street issue. And so with his help, I came up with language. We worked today on it. Um, I ran it by the town planner. And uh, this afternoon, I forwarded to you, Mr. Chairman, the, the draft of the changes that I came up with. I uh, wish we had more time, but we did this afternoon, and I think it avoids um, the direct taking issue, although there may be development that would not proceed because the planning board may not find it suitable to have a large development with a barrier. I mean, they may just, that's part of their jurisdiction. But the language that's been proposed, I don't think constitutes a taking as amended by me today. I lost people. <laughs> yes. Well, the, you might have, but there's there, there's time ahead to sort it out. Now the difficulty. Um, well, let, uh, David, I think the difficulty is some of us didn't get that letter because I, for one, turned my computer off at four o'clock or three thirty. So it would be helpful for all of us to have that. Letter. Well, um, in it is in. Your email. It's it. Unfortunately, if you didn't see it, it didn't come until late in the day. It didn't come before I. So if we're going to discuss it, it would be helpful to have it tonight. Yeah, Councilor Swift, can you I did happen to see it. It came at 4:30, um, and I just happened to get on. Um, and thank you for that ex explanation, but. I was confused. I understood the earlier changes because they did seem sort of technical in nature, you know, changing a few words here and there to, for clarity's purpose. Um, but this did seem like much more of a material change to me, and that's why I was confused because I understood it, that it was not our, the town attorney's role to make <coughs> material changes. You know what I mean? Just because you say something's not a dead end. You know what I mean? It, it, you're just you're changing the definition of something, and that seems more material to me. So I wasn't sure how that worked with your role of under the town charter of what you're supposed to do. Well, again, I have. Um, I'm not taking a position for or against the petition. I looked at the petition. I gave a letter, and I said that under this hypothetical, mm -hmm. this. The interplay between the petition and the dead end street provision may result in land at the end of dead ends that couldn't be connected because it would be a shortcut mm -hmm. not being developed. And the petitioner said, and I agree with him, that I did have the authority, if I thought that would be in a, in a, in a, a taking of that sort of property, to not materially change the effect of the petition, but to a, to basically to confirm what the town planner has said she believes to be the case previously, which is um, they could, the planning board could have an emergency barrier, provide a second means of access, and that would not create a dead end. I, I understand that point. What I mean is it seemed a material change in the petition to me, so I wasn't sure how, since it was, the petition was different from what everybody signed, how that worked. Well, I didn't, even though we had to create language that would fit into the using ordinance, I don't think it changed, I don't think it changed the meaning or effect of the petition. Okay. You know, other than to remove the question of whether it's a take, it would con constitute a taking of people's property, of the developer's property, of the right to develop. Mm -hmm. That's what I think those changes affect or, or will have will cause. Um, yeah, I guess I just interpreted that as a material change, but I'm not an attorney, so that's just how I read it at yeah. 4.30 this afternoon. I was whipping some more emails. Thank you. Council Moles. My question earlier was going to be the same as Ann's, to ask the town attorney to get up, explain what changes have been made, and to ask, do we have a final version? Um, and you give us a final written version of what, what it is that we're discussing. Is it, is it done now or is yes. it still being worked on? Or? 
Well, I think it's done. I, I've submitted that this afternoon. Okay. Mind you, I didn't get the, we didn't get the concern of the, um, I mean, I responded to hypothetical situations and it was presented an opportunity to avoid a, a constitutional issue with deprivation of property without compensation. So I took that opportunity uh, today to clarify it. It was done today. It was passed around to several people, and including the petitioners, council, and the town planner. So it, what I sent over this afternoon is my best shot at correcting this. And Mr. Bryant is satisfied with that? I believe he is. Okay, so, so we have a, a completed document to work with from now on. There's no, no more changes are going to be made. I don't intend okay. to make any more. <laughs> so can, is there someone available to get each of us a copy of that document as we sit here? Is that something that can be popped off an email and printed out quickly? Are there other comments from councillors? Councillor Lynch. I have a comment, and I've studied uh, the dueling lawyer letters that we've received over the last week, the package of material that, has, um, that was in our package that has 33 years of the town police chief and fire chief and everyone in authority saying that um, we need connectivity. Um, I know all of the principals here, Richard, Brian, and I practice law together. We shouldn't say how long ago, right, Richard? It'll date us. Uh, Jim McFarlane and I have swam masters at 5.30 in the morning for years, and I think I practice law with Jim's attorney, too. Um, I, I, everyone here um, I know is approaching this from the standpoint of goodwill, and I accept at face value all of your arguments um, about uh, the importance of neighborhood, and I accept um, at face value the town planner and the fire chief and the police chief's concern about public safety. Um, I will say I am particularly interested in the public safety issue because when I first ran for town council in 2005, um, I had a, a woman who lived on Salt Spray Lane tell me of a story that happened to her in the 1970s when she had a three-year-old child and she needed to um, leave and either go to the doctor or the hospital for a medical emergency. But a tree was down across Broad Cove Road and it took a while to remove that tree. So um, I think while it doesn't happen often, um, the issue of connectivity is important for that person who is waiting to get out with a medical emergency or for the police and fire trying to get in. Um, but I also, was, again, was listening very much to what everyone said tonight about neighborhoods. And I've always thought of Cape Elizabeth as a collection of neighborhoods, and the strength of our community is in neighborhoods. And I thought about that today. I drove over to Cross Hill because I said to myself, why do I not use Cross Hill as a shortcut when I take my kids over to see someone at Elizabeth Farms? And I drove through, and I actually clocked the distance in Cross Hill and around the well, I always go the Wells Roadway and then uh, um, Sawyer. And it was pretty clear to me as I drove through why I don't use Cross Hill as a shortcut. It is shorter in distance. It's eight, te eight tenths of a mile versus a mile the other way. But it is longer in the time it takes me to drive through there. Um, I went back after I did that and I looked through our um, subdivision ordinance. And I, I think we can 
without going the route of banning all connectivity or shortcuts in a way that's been proposed, I think there may be a way, and I realize we can't substitute it, it has to go to the voters, and that's a good thing. Like Priscilla, I am just always impressed with the wisdom, the collective wisdom of the voters, so that's ultimately where I am, is to, it should go out to the voters, but, but I think that there may be ways to address this issue short of banning shortcuts. And I, I was just playing around with some drafts, and what I thought was um, an amendment to our subdivision ordinance, which I can find it here. Um, I would propose that the council think about, and I'm not asking for any action tonight, but I realize it takes about six months from the time something is proposed until it actually goes through um, the reviews that we require for a subdivision um, ordinance change. But I would suggest that we provide language that states very specifically that the planning board may require any reasonable means to discourage traffic through traffic, including stop signs, speed tables, raised pedestrian crosswalks, roadways narrowed to 20 feet, esplanades, and any other reasonable method available to calm traffic and discourage through traffic. I think if that approach were taken um, with the pending development, and so it would need that one MRSA language, um, it would end up looking a lot like Cross Hill. One of the interesting things I learned when I, after I took my little tour, I called the town planner, Cross Hill has streets that are only 20 feet wide. Apparently our ordinance was 24 feet, and then it went to 20, and, we, and Cross Hill was approved, and then it went back up to 22 because Public Works didn't like 20 feet. They thought it was too narrow. But the narrowness of the streets really contributes to slowing and calming the traffic and making it not an attractive cut through. So I would like to pass on to my fellow councilors this um, draft that I worked up this afternoon um, as, a, as a way of trying to address this short of um, a ban on all cut throughs. <coughs> um, and again, I do this not because I don't want to put it to the vote. I have great respect um, for the collective wisdom of the voters, but I think there may be ways that we can really maintain the integrity of our neighborhoods and um, slow traffic and discourage people from cut throughs. So I, I realize none of you have seen this language. I was busy this afternoon trying to write it, but I'll just pass it on to you <clears throat> ask that you all think about that as an approach as we move forward. Thank you. That's all I have. Anyone else? Um, do any of you need a copy of what came via email this afternoon, Michael? Okay. Maureen just made those comments. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you, Maureen. Thank you. Would anyone like to make a motion? Councilor Swift Kayata. I'd like to move um, that action per the recommendation here on our agenda that action on the citizen petition be deferred to our March. 13th, 2006, Town Council meeting. Second. Um, second, Councilor Fritz. Discussion on the motion to defer further action until our March regular meeting. Councilor Mulls. Uh, as you said earlier, Chairman Backer, I would encourage all of our residents to, you know, make their feelings be known over the next month while we all over what we should do with this, this ordinance. Thank you. 
Other discussion? All those in favor of the motion? The motion is approved. Seven in favor, zero opposed. And action is deferred until our March meeting, uh, which will not be an additional public hearing, but it will be the time when the council will resume discussion on our own and decide to either adopt the petition or to send it to public referendum and schedule a date for that referendum vote. Um, just so the public is clear, there were a couple of comments made during the public hearing that, that led me to believe that perhaps um, people believe that one of the options available to the council was to just kill this petition. That is not one of the options available to us. Under the town charter, we are mandated to send it out to a public vote. And the only way it there is not a public vote is if the council prior to the public vote decides to enact the ordinance uh, by vote of the council. So with that matter on our agenda being completed and recognizing that most people who are here probably came for that, I'd suggest we take a few minute break and but people who want to leave, leave. Anyone who is here who would like to stay for the rest of our meeting, you're more than welcome. I We are resuming our Monday, February 13, 2006, regular meeting of the Town Council, and we are at item number 40-2006, proposed amendment to the zoning ordinance, bisected lots. The ordinance committee is recommending that a public hearing be scheduled on the proposed amendment regarding bisected lots. It is recommended that the public hearing be Monday, March 13, 2006 at 7.30 p.m. in the Cape Elizabeth Town Hall. So moved. Second. Discussion on the motion. Could I, Mr. Chairman, could I um, simply thank the other members of the Ordinance Committee for meeting um, Councillor Dill and Councillor Lynch. We met on January 24th and we considered this. It, it um, was a recommendation from the Planning Board uh, to make this amendment to the ordinances. Um, the ordinances currently prohibit any new lots being created that have a road that runs through through the lots um, or bisecting them. Um, the planning board recommended that this be changed and apply only to single family lots uh, rather than a larger piece of land that might have multiplex kind of housing on it and that it because it would really inhibit the planning board's ability to be able to plan and uh, circulation much as we were dealing with with the previous um, issue. Um, so the ordinance committee recommends to the council to hold a public hearing on the 13th. Thank you, Councilor Fritz. Further comment? All those in favor of the motion? 
Motion is approved, seven in favor, zero opposed. The next items on our agenda, items number 41 through 51, um, all involve uh, proposed uses for Fort Williams Park during calendar year 2006. Could I have a motion to consider those as a group? So moved. Councilor Moles. Second. Councilor Lynch, motion. Second. Councilor Moles. Um, discussion on the motion to consider them as a group. All those in favor? Motion is approved. Seven in favor. None opposed. Um, could I have a motion? I move that we set the uh, approval of the uses of Fort Williams Park as, as set forth in items 41 through 51 in our town council packet. Second. Motion and second, Councilor Fritz. Thank you. Discussion on the motion? All those in favor? Seven in favor, none opposed. Next, item number 52-2006, Cape Nordic Ski Update. In uh, December 2005, the, this item was on our agenda. Uh, we heard from the Cape Nordic um, Ski Club, group, club, yes. Um, and we um, asked our town manager to meet with the affected parties and to report back to us um, at our February meeting. Since our town manager is absent at the moment, is our assistant town manager prepared to address any aspect of this or should we hear directly from the Nordic Ski Group? My understanding is we would hear from the Nordic Ski Group so that Mike was recommendations. Okay. Mr. Roberts. Mr. Barton. Mr. Dunphy, are you speaking as a group? We'll speak as a group. Uh, okay. Peter Dunphy is president of Cape Nordic, and uh, Muzzy and I are on the trails committee. Uh, Muzzy is also the uh, head middle school uh, coach. Um, yes, I'm Muzzy Barton. I'm a resident of Gordon's Lane, and um, I've been involved with Cape Nordic for about 10 years and have been involved with coaching the middle school team as well as helping out with the high school team. Um, I think most of our major points were brought forward um, to this group uh, at our last meeting, but I thought I might just briefly touch on a few of the key points that we feel are um, important to uh, the development of, the, of this new trail or proposed trail. Um, again, just like to reiterate that um, one of our primary purposes of this trail would, that, would be that it would be, in fact, a multi-use trail and that um, this is not just the Cape Nordic ski community <clears throat> bringing forth this idea that we feel this trail um, would be something that could be ut utilized by the entire Cape community and would be suitable not just for cross-country skiing, but could also be used for cross-country running, um, recreational running, um, walking, hiking, bird watching, um, snowshoeing in the winter time, um, certainly a multi-use um, trail that would be beneficial to the entire community. Um, we also would, would uh, benefit in that um, by having a new trail developed, um, we also would be able to utilize this trail um, for competitive uses as well, um, both cross-country ski racing as well as um, cross-country running. Um, the cross-country running team at the high school, I know, is also very supportive of, of the development of, of, of these trails. Um, the other thing that I think is important to keep in mind is, again, by developing these trails um, at the close proximity to our school campus, um, it provides a great opportunity for our athletes to travel directly from school um, to run or to ski to the trails in Gullcrest and um, there alleviate some of the added expenses that we've incurred um, in the past in having to bus and transport our athletes to other venues for practice and competitions. Um, if we were able to have this trail and make it a competition-worthy uh, trail, we certainly could have uh, running and ski meets there 
but more importantly, we would be able to practice there, which would alleviate the added town expense of busing our kids to Cumberland as we do um, at present. So that's another great advantage to this system. Um, uh, the other point that we've been uh, proposing and bring, bringing forward is that we really would like to see this trail um, designed and developed um, with some professional expertise helping us out. Um, one of the things that's important in developing a cross-country running or skiing trail is that the trail is, is graded and made suitable um, um, for multi-use, but also uh, to make it um, able to uh, drain well and, and hold up well um, during the entire year. And as a result, we have proposed that we would solicit some professional help in um, designing and developing this trail. In fact, the Cape Nordic uh, board met last week and allocated money um, to help hire a professional design, trail designer for this new two and a half kilometer portion of the trail. And um, the board approved the allocation of those funds so there would be no additional expense to the town if we were to have this professional uh, trail designer help us out um, with that. And we, so we've, we've, we're looking to possibly do that. Um, the other, other aspect that's important in the developing of this trail is, of course, the manpower in cutting and clearing that trail. And uh, we've investigated the number of hours of manpower that we would need to do that. And again, not wanting to um, incur any additional expense to the town, we feel that we could rally the Cape Nordic ski community, the Cape Elizabeth cross-country running community, as well as other interested parties in, in, the, in the town to help us with that clearing and providing that manpower um, to do that. So we envision that we would be able to rally that um, workforce to help with that trail development. And then the last point, and I think this is maybe one of our most important points, is that we really feel that if this is going to be a multi-use trail, we want to work with the entire community. And Dave um, has been instrumental in meeting with um, our town manager and with other interested parties in the community in helping us work with it for the development of this trail. Uh, Dave has met uh, numerous times with members from the Snowmobile Club. And we certainly want to work in concert with those other groups and, and certainly have their input and make this a trail that, that works for everyone. So I think it's clearly a win-win, a not just for our group and, and the ski club, but for the, the entire community. So we hope that it would be accepted. Thank you. Um, does the council have any questions? Councilor Lynch. I have one. Are, are, is anyone looking for any council action tonight, or is it just an update and you all? No, we are, in fact, uh, looking for your approval to go forward uh, with developing a 2.5K loop in the Gulf Crest area. And I, I, I believe you were, did you get forwarded a uh, revised yes. math? Uh, yes, on our we plan? did. It just wasn't clear to me from all the memorandum if we were being asked to do anything tonight. So. Yeah, yes, we're uh, in the, the memo from Cape Nordic regarding the trails. Um, we're asking for concept approval um, because we, we didn't want to go ahead and, and hire somebody to do the work without uh, the approval of the concept by the town council. I guess I do have one question then. I understood last time we talked that um, you were going to work closely with the snowmobile club? Yes. Was the, we, uh, there wasn't a conflict and you would have dual use? Right. And we've, we've had um, several very productive and constructive meetings. And uh, Dave Roberts, I think he was here. Yeah, Jack Roberts. Yeah, I'm sorry, Jack Roberts. Oh, Dave sure. can attest to that. <laughs> but uh, we don't see that there's any conflict. And we're looking forward to working with the snowmobile yeah. club. Uh, so that, that is a revision to uh, what we proposed in December. And uh, I think we may be more clearly defined uh, the uh, area that we wanted to develop, which is in uh, forest hilly or uh, forested areas. There are uh, areas that are not designated wetlands. So we don't feel there will be an issue uh, with any permitting. 
that yeah, might be required. At this time, we want to avoid um, doing any work in, in wetlands where we would have to apply for permits. So. Could we ask our town planner if she believes that there is, are any wetland issues that will require permitting? Well, what we're saying is we don't want to propose anything in areas, so we'll work with um, the, the Conservation Commission and the town planner to avoid those areas where, where they are. I, I guess the concern is that, you know, if you want to go ahead with paying somebody to do trail design, mm -hmm. you want to make sure that whatever they design isn't going to subsequently require any permitting that might be a problem and the process permit guess, you to go forward with that plan. Excuse me. Well, we envision the process here forward would be that we would uh, meet with the Conservation Committee tomorrow night, uh, that we would uh, coordinate uh, when John Morton uh, would come so that uh, members of the Conservation Committee, the Ski Mobile Club, perhaps the cross-country running coaches uh, and any other stakeholders could meet with him. Uh, he will have a copy of the master, the Gulf Crest master plan, which clearly identifies uh, the existing trails, uh, what was proposed, what areas are designated wetlands, what are not, and uh, that then we could uh, offer that guidance for uh, what he lays out, which would generally follow the concept that I think we uh, presented to you, which is in this area that uh, this is just to orientate people and myself. This is the bridge across, the new bridge across the marsh. And right now it's not shown here, but there really is a connector that comes up here. And this section of the outer loop is there. This has grown in and what is now proposed is a connector on this side and this is in this area not even a flag and so what we presented to you would would have a loop that would come up and circle back to avoid any road crossings and parallel this existing trail so that you could have a loop from the athletic fields which I guess are here and come around and circle back without doubling up. So there was just that section, uh, this loop in here and this parallel loop in here that would be required. To be added. To be added. And uh, I, I think the Snowmobile Club had a comment to the, uh, the town manager we hadn't what we've done is highlighted the areas that we wanted to develop and what was existing, and we hadn't shown these as existing uh, because we thought of them as being proposed. But the, uh, that would uh, be part of what would be developed. And that provides access, uh, and it's probably most important to the snowmobile community from town farm property, either um, across the marsh. Uh, this way or uh, back, probably through the Fowler Road extension to uh, Great Pond. So, uh, is it clear what we're asking? Yes. I, I, I think so, and I'd like to have our town planner come up for a minute, if she wouldn't mind. Good, that's just the person. I First of all, I am very supportive of it. I just have a couple of questions. We had DEP site plan approval, is that right? Yes. So if we're doing anything, do we need to have an amendment to that DEP site plan? I believe we do. Okay. So I support it, um, and I would make a motion. I'm kind of thinking out loud. Um, I would make a motion that um, you go forward and plan and work with your trail designer or whatever, and then um, make sure that you get back with the town planner. And I guess us, because we would have to approve going to the DEP for a site plan amendment. Second. But I don't think we can change the face of the earth once the DEP is 
bless that earlier one. <clears throat> I might not have made we, it. we had a motion and we had a second on the motion. But is that not what you want us to do? No, it is. It I is. think maybe I wasn't clear in the, in the process uh, what would be done after meeting with the Conservation Committee and bringing John Morton in is that uh, he would flag it first and then it could be reviewed by the Conservation Committee and any other stakeholders and then it could be revised as necessary and uh, any permitting that might be required to be reworked. We could do it that time. So there would be further opportunity, and that's why I think we uh, asked if we could be prepared, uh, that the town council be prepared to come back in April. That would give time for the, uh, the proposed trail to be flagged, reviewed by the Conservation Committee, which meets the day after you do. So that's why we plan to skip a month. Uh, so that they would have a chance to comment on it uh, for your benefit. Could our town planner come back up for a moment? Sure. Maureen, I assume, I mean, it's sort of the chicken and the egg question, and do we need to have the trail flagged and formally designed before an application is made to modify existing mm -hmm. permits, I assume we do. I mean, the original <clears throat> application that went to the DEP to, to get permitting for the Gulf Crest Master Plan was done by the town engineer and his firm. So you would need to do two scale drawings like this drawing right here that would show the, the route of the, of the path, um, whether or not there are any wetlands involved. So, if, First, we need the proposed trail flagged, step number one. Then the town engineer has to come in and map it. Well, somebody's got to come in and prepare an, yeah, prepare an application. And, and the application will have the town engineer's map attached. Yeah, well, it's forms. There's a site plan application is not something to be entered into lightly. It's, it's, it's fairly dense right. document, yes. Understood. And the uh, process for the DEP application itself, once the application is submitted, what's the turnaround time at DEP on these? It really depends. <laughs> I, I make it a practice never to predict what the DEP is going to do. I agree. <laughs> is it If you remember weeks, the last months? time. It's months. Months. Or years. Months. <laughs> this would be months. Months. And it's, you know, it, it's a question of funding. It's a question of staff time. I, I, I'm sure the council is aware that right now the town engineer is fully engrossed in designing the sewer rehabilitation project that's going to envelop the town this summer. So I'm sure he'll do what he can to, to shoehorn this into that as well. Councilor Swift Kayata, thank you for waiting patiently. here. I understand that, um, or I think I understand that Cape Nordic is uh, only at this point seeking permission to flag the trail. So that's sort of the first step in the process. So I want to I want to make sure I understand that. And then I would like Cape Nordic to address some questions that were in the manager's memo here. Um, before we sort of set our stamp of approval on this, I think there's a number of questions about funding, estimated costs, sources of funding, um, and I'd be interested in how much you think the project is going to cost. I mean, this is a two and a half K trail, and it's, what, 10 to 12 feet wide. So, I mean, that's a fair amount of work. So, and I understand you want to do a volunteer labor, but I'd be interested in funding, um, of the project, the building of it, the maintenance of it, any future snowmaking costs. The manager was quite clear that he didn't see any money in the municipal budget for this. If we have to get the town engineer involved, I just heard who pays for that. And then also, what's the timetable to sort of get this all done? I mean, aside from the permitting, which I know is going to take a while, but it sounds like a big undertaking to me. I, I just know with other Greenbelt trails that we've done, it's hard to get enough volunteers out there to, to do even less ambitious projects than this. And 
lastly, I would like to hear, I see we have a uh, president of the Snowmobile Club here, and I'd just like to hear from them. So those are my concerns before we get ahead to approving flagging. I'd like to know some more about that. Um, I haven't seen the memo that you, you mentioned from Mike McGovern. Um. Okay, <clears throat> it's to the, I'm sorry, it's to, to the Conservation, Conservation Commission um, from Mike McGovern. When, when was it dated? Here. January 19th. It's about a page and a oh. half. And I, I'm particularly interested in the second page, item number three. And I'll just say this, um, I, meaning Mr. McGovern, totally share the concern of the Conservation Commission relating to the funding of any proposed trail work by the Nordic Ski Group. No municipal dollars are available for this work. I've asked the Nordic Ski Group for specifics on estimated costs and sources of funding. I've also asked questions relating to the cost of possible future snowmaking. The Town Council would desire this information prior to acting upon any proposal. And I'm sorry, I thought you had seen a copy of this, but I no. not. So. Um, yeah, with respect to snowmaking, this doesn't has no plans for that. That might be something further down the road, but it um, it's not not related to this at all. Um, and as far as the the uh, once once we do get it flagged, um, then we, we can better determine the costs um, at that point. At this juncture, the Board of Cape Nordic has approved uh, the money to fully fund John Morton, uh, basically four days of his time to uh, design the course, which would be meeting with all the stakeholders, flagging the course, coming back and making any revisions, and basically flagging all the trees that would need to be cleared. Um, the clearing we were planning to do with the human resources within the club, to, and then uh, we were planning at that stage uh, to address any excavation me, Dave, that would be required. Could you just speak up a little bit? Into the mic. Or I'm sorry. Uh, what the board has approved is the funding of John Morton to design the trail, which would be to meet with the stakeholders, flag uh, proposed trail, meet again with the stakeholders, make any changes that are uh, requested, and then flag the trees that would need to come down. Uh, we realized that then we'd need to make another allocation, but it would be at that point we'd, we'd actually have the, uh, an estimate for the cost of excavation. We do feel we can clear the trail and chip the trail with the resources within the club. Uh, which is basically a volunteer effort, uh, but to take it to that next level would require excavation work, which uh, some of it, the existing trails wouldn't require it, nor would any of the uh, areas that are in the open fields. So there's really about a kilometer that we see that would require to really uh, get a uh, uh, professional trail uh, done and uh, you know I probably skip could comment to it but what we were given as an estimate was basically a hundred dollars an hour and uh, it would really depend on the number of culverts or what would have to be done and so I, I can't really give you a figure on that except that it's uh, we're committed to funding that, and we're not going to be seeking money from the town to do that. So but we've, we've funded, or we've approved funding uh, with your approval to actually lay out the course, and then we're committed to clearing it and chipping it so it will be at least to the level that's proposed. Uh, we do intend to take it the next level. And taking it to the next level allows it to be groomed with a minimal amount of snow. So you would be getting this flag, getting your professional person to flag it, and at, after that point you have a better sense of you know, what trees would have to come down and all that kind of stuff. And would you at that point have an estimate of 
how yes. I, I don't know how much money you guys have in your coffers, but it sounds like a big project to me. And What's approved so far is uh, really uh, four or five days of John Morton's time, which is four seventy five a day plus expenses. So we're talking about twenty five hundred dollars initially. Right. Uh, we're looking at doing the clearing ourselves and then uh, funding the balance. Right. So although, although the whole loop is 2.5K, we're only talking about developing about 1K. So it, it's, it's not the... I, I understand. Yeah. I understand we're talking theoretically at this point. But I guess my point is just that I, I think the council would be interested in the information as to how much that, that you had an estimate of how much it was going to cost you and that you had funds or a fundraising plan to raise the funds and also a time to before before I could vote for, I uh, can't speak for the rest of the house, before I could vote for the final approval and going forward with all the permits and all that kind of stuff. Excuse me, Marianne, could you, your, your motion yeah. was to state it. permit the flag in. That's right. It, it, I, I think I wasn't quite sure what they wanted, but I understood the flagging. And I think it's fair to say, let's just take it one step at a time. Let's authorize. And my motion would be to authorize them to do the flagging, take whatever other steps are necessary to develop, fully develop the plan mm -hmm. for the trail, and then come back to the council whether it's April or May or, you know, we're sort of indifferent to that, but come back at that point when, you ha when your plans are complete and you have a budget. Okay. That sounds that makes easy and yeah. simple and you get what you need and... And I, I, still and I would think review by the Conservation Commission and... Uh, well, they said they were working with all the mm -hmm. stakeholders, right. so... Right. Right. And that's how I understood it when I made my second. Okay. And, um, Jack Roberts, president of the local snowmobile club, the other was here when we <laughs> took this up in December. He's here again today. So Jack, if you'd come up, and I know you've emailed us, and I know you've met with the Nordic ski folks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Jack Roberts. For the, I'm not going to spell it. I think you all know how. <laughs> Had enough of that already. Um, I do want to pass out just uh, a copy of the the uh, part of the bylaws for the uh, Snowmobile Club, and I could put on my glasses to read the thing. Just a, a highlight of a section of it that it would, I felt was important based on what we're doing with the, with the uh, Nordic group. And with, part of it says to encourage safety and courtesy in snowmobile riding, and generally in all ways to advance and improve the great winter sport of snowmobile riding, and, and most importantly, to encourage and support other recreational activities such as hiking and cross-country skiing. And that is something that we have been doing with all of the trails that we have out there. And there are approximately three and a half miles of trails that we, that we are maintaining. Um, and on the map, and I did give that to Deborah earlier this afternoon, one of the important links, and granted it has not been cleared out this fall, I ran out of time, but uh, the trail that goes from the access road behind the, uh, or down by the animal site, I'll leave it that way, out to the treatment plant is an important link to us as far as accessing the uh, poor farm, getting back and forth to the other section of, the, of that property. But so basically it's all about sharing and the group met with uh, the Nordic Club with Mike and I want to again publicly thank Mike for facilitating that, making sure that it happened. And, but I, and I want to thank the council also for including us in this process. And what has been developed, we are comfortable with that. Um, we feel that what's been suggested will, can work for everybody as long as we work together. I would like to make sure though, that uh, there is a bullet added on the memo uh, designating snowmobiling as one of those activities that will be allowed. It's uh, down below, but it looks almost like an afterthought. So we really want to have it there. Um, and then the trails that are out there currently, it was my sense also, having been on the Conservation Commission and the Town Council and everything else, that a plan of this magnitude would probably require site plan review going through the, to the DEP. Um, there's the 100 foot, 200 foot buffers you've got to deal with back there, so that's going to 
probably make it very hard to put anything in there that doesn't go through that process. But hopefully th that won't pr prohibit it because uh, that type of a trail back there benefits everybody. The, um, and we're, we're kind of hoping actually that the uh, Nordic Club uh, has some say with the uh, snow gods and perhaps we can get some more snow back there because <laughs> we find that it works. But it, once every three years we get any kind of decent snow that we can actually use. And again, I do want to thank you. The uh, trails, we will continue to maintain them pending all the reviews and before this goes in. So if there are any questions, I see a couple of hands, so I'll... Councilor Moles. I would just want both groups to know that I fully support you going forward with flagging this trail system and, and developing this trail system. I do have one major safety concern that you are very careful on how you can find a way to ensure that it's safe for the cross-country skiers, it's safe for the snowmobilers. Considering the number of snowmobile fatalities we have each year, we don't want to add to that. I cross-country skied for many years and cross-country skied in other locations, and the snow sled trails and the cross-country ski trails are completely separate. So I'm surprised that you're going to be doing this jointly. Uh, but if you can find a way to do it safely, that's, that's great. So. We have some thoughts. We'll get back to you on those later. Councilor Dill. Yeah, I have um, just two questions, and I don't necessarily need answers tonight, but I'd be curious in our later meetings together. One is this idea that um, the um, approval of the trails and creations of the trails is going to save money for the town because it's going to decrease the transportation costs. And what I'm wondering about is how that logistically is going to play out when there's no snow. Like, and I'm just wondering if you've spoken with Sue Weatherby about how it's going to work when there's no snow and how that can be coordinated. My second concern is, um, is similar to um, Mr. Moles, and that is I am a cross-country skier, and I just can't imagine coexisting on a cross-country ski trail with snowmobilers. So I just I, I question whether or not you can have, if you do classic cross-country skiing with a groomed trail, how you can have snowmobiles going up and, up and down. But obviously, that's something that you're going to address. So I look forward to hearing about it. One idea would be to limit the snowmobiles to one side of the trail and just post it to, to do that. We're also considering having the town council perhaps set speed limits on, on that particular section as well. Uh, the other trails, they're pretty much self-limiting because we don't cut these big 20-foot wide trails that you talk with, ITS trails with the accidents, how people are going around corners doing 100 miles an hour. You get it 100 miles an hour in Cape Elizabeth and you're going to be in South Portland before you can uh, get the break. <laughs> so it, that's just not going to happen. The, uh, and the people... The people that are out back primarily are folks like myself that are riding around with their grandkids or their children and everything else. They're not people out there trying to, uh, on doing these commercials you see on the, on the TV where they go flying off the side of a mountain somewhere. It's a different type of riding. But I wonder if word gets out that we have this new developed trail system and snowmobilers are welcome if it's going to... If you're going to put your sled on a trailer, you're going to go inland where there's better snow, where there's wider groomed trails. Yeah. It's a local. <laughs> Thank you. Other comments? Councilor Fritz. I just, I, I wanted to ask Jack, um, since I know he knows this piece of property better than anybody else. No, know what? That you know this piece of property better than anybody else. Um, to help me understand how it, it is, I mean, I assume you've seen that map. Yes. Is the top portion, the yellow portion that's new, is that all, that is all the wooded area generally? That would be all wooded area. The portion from the corner of the treatment plant over to the with that high rise area, in below that area, I think that's going to fall in a wetland, wetland area. From the treatment plant to where?
this here and the way you're going to find is probably the one that I'm fed up to the, the marsh. Yeah, they can be seen. This is just a tenant map. Mm -hmm. It wasn't tenant, but what we were trying to do is stay in the designated areas outside of the wetland. So that was kind of superimposed on this one. The trouble with this big traps. Yeah, I know the site point of view is going to go to the way that the wetland is. Well, what I'm hearing here is that this is a multi-step process with perhaps expenses at each stage. Um, I'd love to see this happen. It sounds like there are other counselors who would love to see this happen as well. And that my sense is that the council is willing to encourage you to go forward if you're willing to spend $2,500 in order to see the next card and see where this leads. Um, yeah, I hear Jack Roberts talk about all the wet areas of this and it doesn't sound very encouraging. Um, but I think you, I guess you won't know that until you see it flagged and, and look at it further. But if you're willing to go forward, um, you know, and spend the money to take it to the next step, I'm in full favor of it. Well, we've walked it and we're using the uh, 2002 uh, master plan for all crest and, and what we've laid out, we feel is considered a forest hilly area. Uh, it's not to mean that there might not be a spring or something that has to be crossed in that existing section. Well, so it, it, you know, again, um, you know, if you're willing to go forward with it, we'll take a formal vote here in about 30 seconds, but my sense is that you're going to get all the encouragement that you want to go ahead and do that. So, any further discussion? All those in favor of the motion? Seven in favor, none opposed? Thank so, you very much. But Go the for next it. Step that could change if, if uh, you know, if it doesn't pan out to be well, you know, okay. to be good. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank so you. you'll come back to us um, after you have it flagged and you're able to get a sense of whether you have right. wetland problems. Um, meet with our town planner, meet with the conservation commission, um, and come back when you're ready to go on to the next step. And I would hope that would include some cost estimates and the mm. funding sure. and uh, timetable. Just to briefly address that, I, we were initially thinking it's probably five to ten thousand uh, dollars, and that we hope to get it flagged <laughs> before summer. This is a good time because the trees, uh, the leaves have dropped, and it's easy to really uh, design a trail in there. And we would actually, it might not be realistic, but we are hoping to have it in place for next winter. Thank you. Can I, can I just make one comment? <laughs> yes, please do. Um, I, I would hope that you would not encourage mountain biking on that trail once it's, if, if this whole thing comes to fruition and everything. Um, it, particularly if the area is wet at all, because boy, can they ruin the trails, uh, you know, in the spring and in the fall or where, whenever the rainy season is. So um, I wouldn't spell that out very often <laughs> in, in publicizing it. Well, the only thing I'd like to add is that this last weekend on Saturday, Muzzy Barton's middle school Cape Nordic team, both boys and girls, went to the uh, state championships at Gould Academy in Bethel. And the girls team took first place. Boys team took third place. Um, an eighth grade girl from Cape Elizabeth, Emily Atwood, um, was the state champ in both the skate and classic for the second year in a row. 
Very impressive. <laughs> so thank you to Coach Barton for all of his great work with the middle school Nordic team. Well, I know they all enjoy skiing with you, including my son. That same day also, the high school had their Western uh, main conference championship, uh, which the boys won overall. Excellent. And may I fairly assume, Dave, that your son was part of the team? Uh, among many. Yes. Well, congratulations to them as well. And I should also note that um, Skylar Dunphy was part of the girls team, and Skylar was at third place in the, fifth place in the classic. Excellent showing. So anyway, thanks to all. Moving on on our agenda. Item number 53-2006, approval of town council goals. So moved. Second. <laughs> Discussion on the motion? All those in favor? The motion is approved, seven in favor, zero opposed. Item number 54-2006, appointments committee report. Yes. Thank you, David. The appointments committee met um, this evening before this meeting. Um, that is uh, Michael Malls and Ann Swift Keata and myself. We interviewed um, three applicants for the Arts Commission, and we are pleased. First of all, I should say all of the applicants were great. As always, it's very difficult to um, choose someone, but we um, are recommending the appointment of Sarah Beard Buckley to fill the vacancy on the Arts Commission. Um, and we, again, want to encourage um, the others to apply again because they were all great candidates in their own way. And um, we would have been pleased to nominate any one of them. Second. And do, do I take that as a motion? Yes, that's a motion. And a second from Councilor Moles. Discussion on the motion? All those in favor of um, accepting the appointment as recommended of Sarah Beard Buckley. Sarah Beard Buckley. All those in favor? Yes, seven in favor. Seven in favor, none opposed. Thank you to the appointments committee and to everyone who applied for that position. Item number 55 2006 uh, mooring permits. Ordinance committee. Um, there is a recommendation that this be referred to the Ordinance Committee for a review of the timeline for the validity of mooring permits. So moved. Second. <clears throat> and Chief Williams, is this something that you would like to address in any way? No. <laughs> don't, feel, don't feel compelled to. We do have your written material, but we're happy to hear from you. What if we just save it? Always happy to hear from you. <laughs> is this what you say as read? No, uh, there is an issue. Uh, we do have uh, in the ordinance right now, it states that mooring permits will be issued for one year. Um, we wanted to change it over. The new harbor master that took over in January of uh, 2005 uh, wanted to change uh, when the mooring permits were issued. In the, in the past, uh, they were just arbitrarily issued in April. Um, he, so he changed that to fit his schedule and for other uh, duties. Uh, he felt it was uh, more apropos to make it in January. And um, once, and, and he, so he sent that out. Uh, we didn't hear anything. And then um, there was some opposition to the January versus April, uh, feeling that, uh, that they were being shorted the four months. Um, we felt that uh, the, the permits were issued for one year, um, like dog license. Uh, if you get a dog in the middle of the year, um, you still pay the same fee. And uh, we didn't think anybody was being shorted 
um, especially 90% uh, uh, of the mooring permits are, are not utilized uh, during the year. Um, I've been keeping a check at Kettle Cove and um, uh, days I see maybe two boats out there, maybe three boats. And uh, so uh, we, we brought it to Mike, or, or actually before we even brought it to uh, the town manager, Mike McGovern, um, we tried to make some changes and that didn't um, appease um, the person that was uh, complaining at the time. Um, so uh, we went to the manager, tried uh, another uh, avenue, and that didn't appear to satisfy uh, the person. So it's before you now. Thank you. Um, any questions for Chief Williams? I just have one question. Is this a change that's recommended to appease one person? Is that what I'm hearing? All as I can tell you is that we've only received one complaint. Is the new is the new um, mooring rule more conducive to an efficient management of the, the waterfront? If you will? I would have to speak for the harbor master, and it's more conducive for him to spend more time in um, assigning assigning uh, spots and uh, getting his paperwork done and keeping. Uh, accurate notes and uh, maps. So it's more efficient the way it's Correct. structured currently. I just want to make that clear. Okay. Councilor Mulls. First, I would say that this affects all of the mooring holders. And yes, there was one in particular that complained but said that he had heard a lot of other complaints. And if we want, we can poll them all and see how they feel. But in general, we had a time frame that people had been paying for historically, then we shortened it without reimbursing them for the time they'd already paid for. Uh, in addition to that, I don't think it is appropriate to have moorings from January 1st to December 31st. Who wants to move moorings in and out at that time of year? I think April, June time frame, where it has, has historically been, whether appropriate to moving moorings in and out, moving boats in and out. Um, now this is the reason this issue flared up is because the last time the mooring um, ordinance was changed, a number of residents felt that they had been shortchanged. The cost of the mooring fees had doubled and the time frame had been cut in half after these residents had already paid for mooring permits. So it's more of a matter of principle with this particular uh, complainant than than anything else. It's a very small fee overall, but you know, the town keeps making these changes and you know, this this it wasn't right what they did. We should either reimburse them for cutting the year short or we should leave the year where it was. Uh, well that leads to another question I guess. Um, if they pay the morning fee for the year and most of the time, what you're suggesting is most of the time the boat or the mooring is, is only utilized maybe six months out of the year for most of the boats? If that. If that. Um, <clears throat> they can pull it any time they want. I, cool. I know when I had a, a mooring, I used to pull it in the fall, put it in the spring. So, I mean, even though I would pay the year, it wasn't really relevant. It's like buying a state park pass. I buy one every year, but... I don't use the state park all year necessarily. Um, I think we ought to consider the fact that it's more efficient for the town to, to conduct its business. And, and um, excuse me, Councilman McKinney, just as a reminder, just so you're sure of the motion, we're not being asked to vote this up or down. We're si it's simply a referral to the ordinance. Committee. I just thought, I think it's important to put these facts out on the table so that when the ordinance committee meets, it has more material to deal with. But thank you. And just, just source was okay. She's been waiting to see you. It's okay. I gotta get my, like, my poker. <laughs> um, I would just recommend, uh, I think I have sympathy to uh, Councilor McKinney's um, views on this, but since we are just voting whether to send it to ordinance, I think perhaps we would do best to send it off to ordinance now, and any councilor who wants to go to the ordinance committee meeting can go to the ordinance committee meeting and then we will hear what their 
recommendation is when it comes back to us and we'll all have an opportunity to speak further at that point. I'm just thinking of the lateness <clears throat> of the hour and the poor chief's been hanging in here for forever. And Mr. Chairman, uh, at the uh, ordinance committee, uh, the harbor master will be there. He was un unable to be here tonight. Okay. Thank you. I, I understood. I just felt that it was important. Urban. Okay. Thank I, you. I had a part in changing the rules last year. <laughs> so it was very recent, yeah. <laughs> um, Councilor Moles? And, and lastly, for the record, the complainant happens to be a commercial fisherman whose boat is in year-round, which is what is the source of this, this issue. Okay. And in addition to that, I've read the harbor master's letter that went out, and I thought it was lacking. So we, we need to work on that issue. All those in favor of the motion to refer this to the Ordinance Committee? Seven in favor, none opposed. Thank you. Thank you, Chief Williams. You're going to stay for the rest of our meeting? You're welcome to. There's one more issue on uh, the South. I just want to make a call. Okay. Item 61. We'll be there momentarily. Item number 56-2006, Capital Improvement Plan for 2007 through 2011. Councilor swift Kayata. I'd like to move that we acknowledge receipt of the proposed Capital Improvement Plan for 2007 to 2011. Second. A motion and a second. Discussion? All those in favor of the motion? Seven in favor, none opposed. Item number 57-2006, Cumberland County Community Development Block Grant. Do I have a motion? This is something that we took up in workshop yes. recently. Okay. I'll make a motion. Councilor Lynch. Um, I move that the town council endorse the proposal of Cumberland County to become an entitlement recipient for the purposes of community development block grants. Thank you. Second. Second, Second Councilor McKinney. Um, discussion on the motion. Councilor Fritz. I, I'm going to be voting against this. I, I, it seems like an, an expansion of county government, which I think we could just as soon get rid of rather than expand their responsibilities. I think, well, Councilor Mills. Well, I, I happen to have spoken to the county manager on this recently, and just for disclosure, I am the vice chairman of the Cumberland County Budget Advisory Committee. Uh, the reason the county is asking for this is because it would enable them to be able to go after federal grants, where right now they're limited to uh, approximately half a million, six hundred thousand dollars in grants this would uh, more than quadruple that. That would allow them to go up substantially in the dollars and grants that they would be able to give and use throughout the county and hopefully in Cape Elizabeth. So it's, it's not uh, local tax dollars, it's federal tax dollars that we would be gaining from this, which right now most of the, most of the grants now are going into Portland itself and not being shared throughout the rest of the county, which is why we'd like to endorse this. Further discussion? All those in favor of the motion? Opposed? Six in favor, Councilor Fritz. Opposed. Item number 58-2006, one of the Council's all-time favorites, alewife regulations. We have a motion. I'll move that we adopt the 2006 alewife regulations for the town of Cape Elizabeth. I second, second the motion. As set forth in our package. Second, yes. Councilor McKinney. Discussion on the alewife regulations motion. Councilor Moles. Um, the alewives have to go up and down alewife brook for this to, to work. Uh, <laughs> alewife brook has. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. This is, 
It's really it's late. I, <laughs> they no, have, I know they it's have to go up and down. The well, road. well, for the stocking program to work, my, my question is that at some point we have a discussion with maybe through a workshop, we get the, the town planner in. A, a request has been made to work on that brook, uh, maybe, you know by hand shovel or by backhoe to dredge it and make it so the alewives can actually go up and down it. So at, at some time we sh would like to, I would like to bring this discussion forward on what the appropriate procedure is for getting permission so that the, so that the actual alewife program works. All I wanted to, to raise, because as it currently stands, is, it's very difficult on the alewives to get up and down the program. <laughs> The, uh, assistant, the, the assistant town manager is making note of your concerns. Thank you. Thank you for those. All those in favor of the motion? Seven in favor, none opposed. It's like the Save the Alewives broker. <laughs> Item number 59-2006, sewer project funding application. It is proposed that the town council authorize an application to the Maine Municipal Bond Bank for the $5.4 million financing of the sewer rehabilitation project with an estimated 65% of the amount from the State Revolving Loan Fund, State Revolving Loan Fund loan, and with 35% from the spring 2006 issuance of the Maine Municipal Bond Bank. The exact percentage is to be determined by the Maine Municipal Bond Bank and the Maine Department of Environmental Protection. So um, moved. <laughs> Second. A motion from somewhere down there. So. Do we know how? Councilor McKinney and a second. Councilor Swift Kayata. Discussion. Do we know how likely <clears throat> the bond bank with the revolving fund? Um, I mean, how likely it is that we could get money from the revolving loan? I don't know what the criteria is. I mean, is this, do we expect to have it funded this way, or are there priorities, or, I mean, I don't. As I recall, I the town no manager way. spoke about that, and it sounded like it's, it's pretty much a, a given we're going to get the money. Okay. I, the I was under the understanding that the town manager is expecting the funding to okay. be approved. Okay. And he has already made the application, so unless we have serious reservations, we ought to <laughs> authorize it. I have no problem. All those in favor of the motion? It is approved. Seven in favor. None opposed. Item 60-2006, rescue fees. Council, uh, Chairman Backer, I would move um, that we adopt the rescue fees um, as set out in our package. Second. second. Motion, Councilor Fritz. Second, uh, Councilor McKinney. Um, discussion, Councilor Moles. I'm disappointed the chief isn't here tonight to talk to us about this. This has, seems to have come before us every year for the last several years in a row, and every year he's come before us and asked us to increase the fees that they charge. And I think he's kind of, I don't want to say that he's outright said he wasn't going to keep increasing the fees, but he, he keeps coming back to us increasing the fees every year. Maybe. Councilor Lynch could explain why we need to keep increasing the fees. Well, I, I would just note that we're increasing them in conformance with the Medicare allowed rates. So we are just increasing them to get the amount of money that we are allowed to get under Medicare. It seems to me to be fiscally responsible to do that and would be irresponsible of us not to try and recover from Medicare that which every other rescue operation is allowed to recover from Medicare, so. I, I just, and, and Council, and just correct me, I talked to Chief Magulder briefly about this today to see if he had any comments because he did have another meeting this evening. Okay. He said he could call him if he's you know, still there if he had any questions, but it is simply to keep up with Medicare. Council Moles. Makes sense. My concern is that we have no documentation to show what our actual costs are in comparison to the fees. 
And my, my real concern beyond that is, okay, I understand for those people that have insurance, that we get reimbursed from their insurance, and we have a lot of senior citizens that need rescue calls more frequently than the rest of us, and this helps fund those rescue calls. But what about those people that, for whatever reason, are, you know, shorter on funds, don't have the insurance, do we chase them for these fees or do we write them off? What do we, what do, we do in that case? Because again, we keep increasing these fees every year. Not everyone can afford to pay these fees. And you know, if we have someone that has a serious situation that they've had to call a rescue, they're probably going to incur a lot of other medical fees above and beyond, well above and beyond the cost of the ambulance ride. But, you know, do we, do we then chase these people to the nth degree to, to collect another $25? Councilor swift Kayada. It's my understanding, based on several years of presentations during uh, finance committee meetings, that no, we do not chase people for okay. these fees. We, if they have insurance or Medicare, we, we the town, sends out the bill. Um, and we ask, I think, it's once. And if if, if we don't get it, we don't chase people. We aren't dunning people. We aren't, you know, chasing them down. So. Well, I, I, I'm fine with that and agree with what Councillor Lynch said about needing to be appropriately fiscally responsible and collecting what we can from those that are insured. All those in favor of the motion? Seven in favor, none opposed. Item number 61-2006, Dispatcher Report. Councilor swift Kayada. I propose that um, I move that we acknowledge receipt of the report regarding uh, dispatcher consolidation, and we request the town manager to make a recommendation on the consolidation study after he consults with the other communities and with the Cape police and fire chiefs. Um, and according to what we have here, he would say that that recommendation would be in conjunction with our fiscal 07 budget process. I second the motion. And this was, of course, the subject of our recent workshop. <coughs> Discussion on the motion? All those in favor? Seven in favor, none opposed. Item number 62-2006, lightning report. Excuse me, David. I believe the chief Oh, I'm sorry, Please Chief. Just want to Did you want to make a comment on Just the last one, item? I'm not going to change your vote. <laughs> <laughs> Just one quick comment before sorry. I leave, because I was yeah. asked at the uh, workshop the other night what the time frame was, and I think it was uh, Councillor uh, swift Kayata that uh, asked me that question. And I said October. Well, I was at a conference Thursday and Friday and met with uh, um, a representative of uh, the 911 board, and we have to have a letter in by July 1st of this year just to um, make our recommendations and, uh, and where we are going on the PSAP issue only. Okay, just so you're aware of that. And I so, didn't misspeak the other night. That's why so I just So we have to have a formal recommendation to the PUC? To, to, the, to the PUC, that's correct. By July 1st. By July 1st on where the PSAP, where we feel the PSAP should be going. Okay. That's okay. all. Thank the you. Consolidation is a separate issue. Thank you, Chief. All right, thanks. Do you want to stick around for the lightning report? <laughs> <laughs> We're on the lightning report. Councilor Moles. I would move that we acknowledge receipt of the lightning report as uh, we had discussed in our recent workshop, and then I'll make a motion on what to, to do with it. Okay, we'll take, them in, it, we'll take them in two steps. Yeah. Um, first, a motion to acknowledge receipt. Okay, I second. Second, Councilor McKinney. Uh, discussion on the motion just to acknowledge receipt. All those in favor? Seven in favor, none opposed. And a subsequent motion? Uh, it's a little lengthy, but it covers the whole issue uh, of the lightning and grounding report on our communication system. Uh, whereas it is expected to cost $110,000 to 
to remediate lightning grounding issues with the town communication system and whereas the town manager has presented the council with an organized plan to remediate the grounding issue in two phases, I recommend that we recommend to authorize I move that we I move that the council authorize the town manager to spend the amount of money not to exceed seventy thousand dollars from surplus funds or from the undesignated fund balance as needed to address communication system grounding issues at the town center fire station, the community center, the police station, and the town hall, and that the additional funds expected to amount uh, up to $40,000 to remediate issues at the Thomas Memorial Library, the public works garage, and the transfer station be handled through the fiscal year 2007 budget process. Thank you. Councilor <coughs> swift -Kayana. Point of information. The first part, was that what was the phase one yep. stuff? And the second part was the phase two? Yeah, I just read so off the phase, phase one. And the then phase, phase two three. was during the 07 budget process. And, the, and could you just repeat what your motion said about the phase one stuff? That we would authorize them to spend an amount not to exceed $70,000 from surplus funds or the okay. undesignated fund balance as needed. And can we specify the surplus fund from, from the 06 budget? Oh, sorry, from the 06, I had meant that, but yes. Thank you, I just wanted to make sure I understood. From 06 budget. Do we have a second? Yeah. I'll second that. Second, Council Hall. I think that's consistent with what we discussed in our workshop yeah. I think it was mm -hmm. Councilor Fritz did you have a comment? well I guess I was wondering why this recommendation the wording here was not did not reflect what we discussed it but I guess we had already had our information and in our packet for I, I think that the when, uh, when the, we had our workshop on Thursday the agenda was put together before our workshop mm -hmm. And the town manager at the workshop asked us at, to, at tonight's meeting to authorize the expenditure of funds as included in Council Mull's motion. But I mean, he already had that outline for the first phase and the second phase, so that was puzzling me. But um, Well, he, he asked us because he needed our permission to spend the funds. Uh, Councilor Dill. I'm trying to recall um, what I, I had thought that the town manager was going to take into consideration some of the requests for information and um, ideas that were presented at the workshop. And so I guess I had understood that we were going to get that feedback before actually authorizing the expenditure of money. And specifically, I was um, curious about the uh, fiber optic idea mm -hmm. and how it may be. Um, a way to address the town council goal of exploring alternative energy but at the same time addressing the lightning issue. And secondly, I thought that we had some raised some questions about causation and, and I thought that that was going to be developed a little bit more. So I just, does that even, I'm a little troubled by it. Just looking to see if there's anybody with a hand up down here. <laughs> Start at this end and move our way down. I, I That's recall what I that you asked for that information, and I understood that Michael would be following up, but I did not understand that that was going to be in lieu of um, an authorization to spend the money and start to get this problem fixed. I'm not sure that the two are inconsistent. Councilor Mulls. I, I spoke to Mike briefly after the, the workshop, and I think during the workshop we had a uh, consensus that even though we didn't know the exact cause of the problem, that we had faith in the engineers that this would remediate the problem. Uh, and the cost of going to fiber optic for our communications, you could be talking half a million, a million dollars. I mean, that would be an extremely expensive 
switch to make, and I think he plans on bringing that information back to us, but not between last Thursday night and tonight. Councilor Swift Kayata. I just need some help with the chronology here. Our council workshop was last Thursday, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but we got the packet the day before on the Wednesday. So yeah, I'm just, I also was troubled as Councilor Fritz was as to why this didn't, this recommendation didn't seem to be quite in sync with the workshop, but I think the workshop uh, clarified things versus what this motion, this what this recommendation was. So I would support uh, Councillor Moles's proposal, his motion. Councillor Fritz. I guess, uh, like Councillor Dill, I am still unsure. I would hate to go and spend money on getting something fixed if we wanted to explore the fiber optic option anymore or to be sure that we were proceeding in the right manner. I understand that the manager wanted to get it fixed, um, but I, I guess I want to be clear that that report was kind of, you know, left some issues to be resolved and maybe looked at. I was under the impression that the fiber optic, as much as it might be an interesting long-term solution um, was a very long-term solution. And that in the relatively recent, uh, relatively short term, which could, be, which could span several years, that it just needs to be fixed. Councilor Mulls. And along those lines, I think the manager pointed out that in the short term, we have to have a copper connection uh, because when the power goes out, the fiber optic is gone. It's not a matter of it, you know, shorting out, but it, it stops. Uh, whereas as long as you have a copper connection, the uh, power is always on on the telephones. And for public safety reasons, we, we needed to continue with the current system for some time. Councilor Swift, you it. Um, I can't recall exactly how Councillor Moles worded uh, his recommendation, his motion, but if we were to say that we authorize the town manager to spend the money, the phase one money um, from the 2006 operating surplus or the undesignated fund balance, as opposed to mandating that he spend it, when he comes back, if, he, if we've just authorized him to spend it, if he thinks this is the wrong plan and we're, we're confused, then he doesn't have to spend it and he can come back to us next month and say, no, what I'd really like is something else. But so as long as we've just, if you would take that as a friendly yeah. amendment well, to, just say we, to authorize him to spend it. It says uh, that the council authorized the town manager sure. to spend an amount of money not to exceed $70,000. That way it's not mandating that he has to spend it. and if seems that we have some somewhat different recollections, some of us. And when he comes back, he can clarify that. And if it's not what he recommended, then he's not going to spend the money. And we can do something different next month. So let's support the motion that Council Moles. All those in favor of the motion? Seven in favor, none opposed. It is now 10.59 and 22 seconds. I would suggest that item number 63-2006 for us to go into executive session to uh, discuss the annual evaluation of the town manager be held on another evening. Do you want to have a motion that it be tabled to a specific evening? But don't table it yet, just because I have I know. Questions. I didn't um, table it. I was asking okay. the question. Sorry. <laughs> I don't have a specific evening in mind, but I don't have a calendar with me. Um, I would uh, suggest that whenever we are next scheduled to convene for either a workshop or a council meeting, that we take it up then. That is March 13th. I, I, if I may. If, I, don't, I don't know that this is going to take a long time. I, I'm thinking 
five yeah. minutes. A very short executive session, so that's perhaps what we I, ought to get another way. Okay. That's what I was going to say, because otherwise, it's, I'm, I'm trying to be sympathetic to the manager's need to get his evaluation and to hear about any compensation. To well, that's fine. If, if the sense is this will be quick, then let's go ahead and do it. And well, let's certainly not take five minutes talking about it out here if we think we can do it all in five minutes back there. Well, is it fair to ask if there's anybody who thinks it's not going to be quick before we agree to do that? Is there any? Did you hear what my question was? OK. I think it's going to be quick. OK. Okay. Then could I have a motion on item number 63-2006? So moved. We need motion something we more specific. We go into executive session to review the manager's report. Uh, we have to stay I, I, in, exactly. in conformance with 1 MRSA section 405 paragraph A. We do have to okay. state that specific. I make a motion that we go into executive session in conformance with 1 MS MRSA 405 paragraph A for the purpose of, of discussing the annual evaluation of the town manager. Second. The, the, I, I've just been advised that since the, it is no longer 1059, then I it is now 1101. Could I have a motion to take this item up as an item after 11 o'clock? Like so move. Oh. Mm -hmm. I second that motion. All those in favor of suspending the rules to take an item up after 11 o'clock? Seven in favor, zero opposed. Back to. Go into executive session. A motion to go into an executive Second. session under 1 MRSA section 405, paragraph A. Second. All those in favor? Seven in favor. Zero opposed. Um, and we will not be taking any votes while in executive session. Um, we will come out of executive session back into our regular council meeting um, for the sole purpose of hearing a discussion of items not on the agenda <laughs> and for the purpose of adjourning. <clears throat> Shall we um, go off the air at this point? And we are going off the air and we will not be back on this evening.